to our RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, September 14th, 2023. I call the meeting to order at 4 p.m. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website, riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, and it is open to the public. Trustee Dr. Hernandez Alexander, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mr. President, we do. Do we have any items submitted for closed session items only? Not at this time, no. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we adjourn the meeting at 4 p.m. and we'll return at 5.30 p.m.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm reconvening our Board of Education meeting at 5.44 p.m. Welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, September 14th, 2023. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. A limited overflow meeting room with a television monitor will be available if the main boardroom meets capacity. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD Board Meeting YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the board, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will assist you. Regarding uh, closed session, we don't have anything to report on, right? No, we don't. No, no items to, to report. Uh, and uh, I will turn now for our Pledge of Allegiance to, on, to a video uh, featuring Daniel Garcia, who is a sixth grade student from Monroe Elementary School. My name is Daniel Garcia. I'm a student here at Monroe Elementary. My mother's name is Daniela Garcia, and my father's name is Andy Garcia. My teacher's name is Mrs. Trailer, and my, my principal's name is Ms. Forrest Bertrand, and my vice principal's name is Mrs. Dow. Now, I'd please like you to join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and uh, it's great to know how f uh, the level of familiarity and engagement that Daniel has uh, with the sc school's leadership. Uh, so I'm going to turn now for our uh, with our high school student representatives. Uh, at this, this is the time of year where we're happy to invite our high school students back to our board meetings to provide reports from their school. And our first group of students, we rotate them, are North, Polly, Ramona, and STEM. And so we'll start with Ubong Ibekwe from John W. North High School. Thank you, and good evening, Board President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. I'm Ubongi Bekwe from representing John W. North High School, and as representative, representative to the Board of Education, I'm also able to serve as our inter-club council president, in which I preside over our homecoming tailgate, club rush day, and our Husky Pride Day. So I'm both honored and excited to share my first board report, and I really look forward to many more. So to start off at our ninth annual leadership retreat that we held before school began, we were able to invite leaders from our clubs, organizations, and sports teams to help our student body create five pillars to guide our school year. So with our theme of Husky Pride since 65, hashtag Huskies Groove, we collaboratively committed to create a positive vibe on campus through promoting five pillars, inclusivity, involvement, recognition, school spirit, and unity. In order to promote inclusivity, we have adopted the FAIR acronym. So when sponsoring events and activities, we leaders determine first if the activity will be fair to all of our students. And what FAIR means is F for financially affordable, A for accessible, I for inclusive, and R for relevant. So one example of how we're implementing this acronym in our school year is our student leaders felt that CIF's new ticket policy is not FAIR. And essentially what this ticket policy is, is you have to purchase your ticket online via debit or credit card. And because not all students have a debit or credit card, we decided to lower our student body card from $35 to $10 to make sure that all of our students are able to attend our home games for free if they have that $10 VIP card. And by implementing this, we increased our sales from approximately 200 per year to over 600 this year. Um, how we're increasing involvement in our School Plus Two activities is we held our freshman first day and we were able to invite over 400 freshmen and welcome them to Hus into the Husky family and just introduce them to the clubs and activities we have to offer at North High School. And freshmen, they were able to make new friends and learn more about our high school through this event. 
On our first day of school, we, as we greeted students at our front and back gates, they were able to feel the nice and cool results of our new HVAC renovations that happened over the summer in our 200 and 300 building complexes, including the renovation was new flooring, ceiling, lighting, along with interior and exterior paint jobs. And as a student, it really felt great to walk into campus and feel and see all of the results of this facelift that our school is getting. And it really creates a positive atmosphere on campus by just restoring some of our existing buildings. So in an effort to increase school spirit and unity, we recognized our football team at our welcome back rally before our first home football game. All students were able to receive a flask free class t-shirt at our back to school registration and they were encouraged to show their husky pride by wearing their shirt to the rally and for free food at our tailgate that we held before the football game. So students were able to invite or were invited to attend the football game free of charge if they wore this class shirt and it was amazing to see all of the class shirts at the tailgate and the football game. So something that's new to John W. North this year is Husky Hour which is an enrichment period in which students can book a 45 minute appointment with our teachers on campus and they can use that time to make up a test, um, do incomplete work, or just use it as study hall if they need to. And I personally find it amazing that on Mondays and Wednesdays, I can go to sleep about 45 minutes earlier because I know on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I have Husky hour. So, <laughs> Um, the new school year, it's well underway and we're really excited to implement all of our five leadership pillars and all of the decisions we make throughout this year. That concludes my report and thank you. Thank you for that great report, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, representative is Claire uh, Kunzman from Riverside Polytechnical High School. Good evening, President Frug, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. I am Claire Kunzman, the Vice President of ASB for Public Relations at Poly, and I am so excited to be the board representative for this school year. I would like to start off by saying that we had a great start to this school year, especially in the number of students. Our enrollment and attendance has increased significantly. I would also like to mention that this year's back to school night was a huge success. We were able to bring back for the first time since 2019, the traditional version of how you would hold a back to school night where the parents can go into the classrooms and interact with the teachers one-on-one, -on -one, learn more about all the great things that are happening on campus. Some other exciting activities we have are Club Rush. We had a very successful two-day Club Rush event with over 50 clubs participating and countless new students becoming members. We also welcomed Polly's first CIF girls flag football team. This is something new for all schools, and so far there has been a huge turnout at the games, and not to mention, we have currently gone undefeated. Our theater program has also been working tirelessly over the summer to prepare for their first performance called The Show That Goes Wrong to help kick off the arts programs for the school year. We had a great turnout over the show's five-day run. In terms of upcoming events, we have homecoming season around the corner, which is a big deal for Polly and something we take a lot of pride in. We have the homecoming dance, a week of float building, followed by the annual homecoming pancake breakfast, followed by the traditional parade and carnival, finally ending with the football game on September 30th. The Friday before homecoming will be our annual Bears of Distinction ceremony, which is in simpler terms, the Hall of Fame that Polly has. And we are welcoming seven new members. And those members are class of 98, Alan Yang, who is a producer and screenwriter with multiple credits, including the NBC show Parks and Recreation. The next member is class of 97, Bobby Kim, who is a fashion designer and founder of the Hundreds Clothing Line. Class of 85, Dr. Sean Ginwright, who is a Harvard professor and scholar of African-American youth. And class of 82 is Holly Mitchell, former state senator and LA County supervisor. Class of 64, Bobby Bonds, MLB Rookie of the Year, and MLB All-Star. And then a Poly student from Class of 46 to 48, David Scott, who was part of the Apollo 15 pilot and the seventh man to walk the moon. Class of 42, Oscar Medina, who is a Riverside entrepreneur and founder of Zacatecas Restaurant. We are delighted to welcome this amazing group of alumni and all their great accomplishments. That is all I have for you today, and thank you for your time, and I look forward to bringing the next report in a month. Thank you, Claire. What a distinguished alumni in history uh, the school has to celebrate. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, our next speaker is Brooke Hernandez uh, from Ramona High School. Welcome, Brooke. 
Good evening, Board President Dr. Angelo Farouk, Superintendent Ms. Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Brooke Hernandez, and I am excited to report here on Ramona High School's behalf. Currently, I am a senior involved in USB, AVID, VAPA Council, Color Guard, and the dance team. I was also just accepted into the RUSD Honors Musical, which I am super excited about. On behalf of our Ramtastic community, we would like to thank Mr. Brentley for attending our back to school night and engaging with our Rams. The Body of Freedom, presented by the Center for Social Justice and Civil Liberties in collaboration with Inlandia Institute, Division 9 Gallery, and Ramona High School, supports 15 local community-based artists to create collaborative, inclusive art workshops rooted in social justice and equity. These free multidisciplinary workshops in dance, yoga, music, visual art, and more uplift our communities and empower one another. The art created in the fall workshops will accumulate into a community mural at Ramona High School and a collaborative exhibition titled The Body of Freedom, which will run February 1st through March 16th in 2024 at the Center for Social Justice and Civil Liberties. Also, Ramona is very excited to welcome our new assistant principal. We know he's watching. And that is it. Thank you for your support and involvement in providing opportunities for the students at Ramona. Thank you. Thank you for that report, Brooke. Our last report is from Jefferson Lee from Riverside STEM Academy. Welcome, Jefferson. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board members. My name is Jefferson Lee, and I am proud to represent Riverside STEM Academy this year. I'm proud to say that we as a school are off to a great start with the help of our teachers, PTSA, and student body. ASB kicked off our August by hosting our ninth grade orientation. We welcomed the incoming ninth graders to our school by introducing them to each other and their upperclassmen leaders. In the same month, we held our annual back to school bash where we provide our students with a fun event to welcome them back to school. We provide the students with the opportunity to play ping pong, gaga ball, watch movies, and many more. PDSA also generously provided us with ice cream and drinks for the student body. Additionally, STEM had our annual club rush in which all our schools clubs were able to showcase themselves and encourage new students to join for this year. Some featured clubs include Speech and Debate, STEM and STEM Dev, our coding club, where they have begun preparing for upcoming competitions. Finally, in September, we've been preparing for our homecoming dance. We recently just had our homecoming assembly where it was filled with a skit, performances, games, and most importantly, our theme reveal, cyberpunk. ASP has also hosted a Hawaii-themed Hawaii -themed spirit day to bring awareness to Maui fires. Students wrote letters to affected people and had the opportunity to donate to them as well. We, as ASB, will continue to put our utmost effort into providing not only an environment where our student body can feel comfortable, but also make everlasting memories. We are proud to have made such extensive strides and improvements in our events and have such an amazing student body. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson, and thank you to all of our student representatives uh, for your reports, and we really appreciate your advocacy and leadership. Uh, you're welcome to stay as it's a public meeting, but feel free uh, to do homework or go home. or Whatever you guys need to do with your time, we respect that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move now to our district group reports. Our first group report tonight will be provided by Ms. Maritza Monfil from our District English Learner Advisory Committee, or DLAC. Uh, she'll be provided with 10 minutes for her report in order to allow for interpretation from Spanish to English. Welcome, Maritza. Buenas tardes, eh, Presidente Dr. Faru, miembros de la mesa directiva, señora Gil, mi nombre es Maritza Monfil, Presidente del Comité DILA, Y mi, equipo, y mi nuevo equipo, la señora Rafaela Sánchez, vicepresidente, y Mariela Fernández, secretaria. Good afternoon, uh, President Dr. Farouk, uh, board members, and Mrs. Hill. My name is Maritza Monfil, president of the DILAC committee, and my new team members, Ms. Rafaela Sánchez, vice president, and Mariela Fernández, secretary. También damos la bienvenida a la señora Carolina Michelle a nuestro comité y damos las gracias a la señora Esther García todo el apoyo y dedicación que aportó a los aprendices de inglés. We also welcome Ms. Carolina Michelle to our committee and we thank Mrs. Esther García for all the support and dedication she gave our English learners. 
Estamos empezando este curso 2324 y queremos enfocarnos en los padres, el cómo involucrarse en la educación de sus hijos y que le den el mejor apoyo a ellos y que obtengan el mejor éxito en la vida. We are starting the 2324 school year. We want to focus on parents, how they can get involved in their children's education and support them to be successful in life. Tenemos en meta que este curso tengamos más participación de los padres y que sus hijos obtengan un mejor GPA y más in ingresos a colegios y universidades. Our goal for this year, this school year, is to have more parental participation and for their children to achieve a better GPA and to have more admissions to colleges and universities. El punto es pedir el apoyo más posible de ustedes y hacer que la comunidad se una más a nosotros para tener más participación en juntas, talleres, etc. Queremos incrementar la participación de padres de nuestros aprendices de inglés en ILA y demás. The point is to ask for as much support as possible from you and to get the community to join us, to have more participation in meetings, workshops, etc. We want to increase the parent involvement of parents of our English learners in ELAC and so on. Los padres nos están pidiendo el apoyo de ustedes para obtener nuestras juntas híbridas y quisiéramos que tomen esto en consideración y si, y si puede ser posible. Parents are asking for your support to have hybrid meetings, and we would like you to take this into consideration if possible. Necesitamos talleres productivos que ayuden a nuestros padres a tener bases para ayudar a nuestros hijos, tener una conexión profunda con ellos y con la ayuda de los maestros y ustedes, obtener resultados efectivos. Queremos sean una diferencia en que, en que tengan una identidad, seguridad, sana autoestima, empatía, inteligencia emocional, autocontrol, principios y valores. We need productive workshops that will help our parents to have a foundation to help our students, to have a deeper connection with them, and with the help of the teachers and you, get effective results. We want our students to make a difference, to be their own person, to be safe, to have a healthy self-esteem, to be empathetic, to have emotional intelligence, self-control, principles, and values. Y por último, continuamos invitándolos a nuestras reuniones de DILA, que siempre son el último miércoles de cada mes. Además, queremos pedirles a los directores de nuestras escuelas que sigan asistiendo a nuestras reuniones. Se agradece su apoyo. Muchas gracias, la Junta Directiva de DILA. Thank you. And finally, we would like to continue inviting you to our DLAC meetings, which are always the last Wednesday of each month. Also, we would like to ask our school principals to continue attending our meetings. Your support is appreciated. Thank you very much, DLAC's Executive Board. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Farouk, if I may, I just want to point out that Senora Monfil will be honored by a local nonprofit, Excelencia Latina, next week for her hard work and representation of our students. Felicitaciones. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, uh, Superintendent Hill reviews some of those recommendations and yes. input uh, for follow-up. So thank you for that. Uh, our next report, district group report would have been uh, Ms. Alicia Ricks um, from Special Education Community Advisory Committee, but she's unable to, uh, to be here, and so she'll be able to provide it next time. Uh, our next, I'd like to welcome Ms. Jag Patel, president of the Riverside Council Parent Teacher Association, to provide us a report. Welcome, Jag. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and distinguished members of the board. My name is Jack Patel, president of Riverside Council's PTA for the 2023 to 25 term. This year, Riverside Council PTA celebrates 95 years of fulfilling the organization's mission to support and speak on behalf of children in schools, in the community, and before governmental bodies and other organizations that make decisions affecting children, to assist parents in developing the skills they need to raise and protect their children, and to encourage parent and public involvement in the public schools. This mission statement embodies a theme our board members and chairpersons believe describes the commitment to their communities and schools. And that theme is RCPTA, we serve, they thrive. It is who we are together that makes PTA what it is. This partnership helps make families feel welcomed, 
and empower us to support success so they can continue to thrive in their educational pathways. Currently, our CPTA has 3,645 active members, which encompasses our 41 units that we serve. Our units continue to have membership drives, and we look forward to increasing that number. So if you haven't become a member at any of our units, consider becoming an active member at your local school community. We also have our Reflections Art Program underway at many of our units, and this year's theme is I Am Hopeful Because. This amazing program increases community awareness about the importance of arts and education by encouraging students to unleash their creative talents and express themselves in their artwork. Council would also like to extend an invite to the board and cabinet members to attend our annual presidents and principals meeting coming up on Thursday, September 28th at Sierra Middle School's cafeteria starting at 9 a.m. This meeting is the first for the new year and it ensures success when school administration and the respective school PTA units are starting on the same page. In addition, Riverside Council PTA is grateful for the opportunity provided by RUSD to attend the 10th anniversary of the Excellence Through Equity Conference from September 21st to the 22nd. This year, our Founders Day meeting will be held on February 21st, 2024, tentatively at Jefferson Elementary. And the annual RCPTA Awards and Scholarship Brunch will be on April 17th, 2024, at the new RCOE Conference Building. Our council members look forward to the continued participation and engagement within the PTA organizations of Riverside Unified School District. This ongoing partnership with RUSD allows us to provide our students with educational enrichment opportunities which embrace inclusiveness with a focus on diversity and equity. In closing, please keep in mind that members of our council are here to serve as a child advocacy resource for the RUSD community. Thank you for your time and continued support. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for your report. Uh, before before we go uh, further, uh, we found a card outside uh, from for someone named Arturo Ramos. Uh, so if, if anybody uh, knows who that is or can identify it, then um, please let us know. Uh, so our next uh, part of our agenda is our superintendent report. So I'll turn it over to Renee Hill. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. I'll keep my um, notes brief today. In the last couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to visit Washington Mountain View and Highland Elementary and Jefferson Elementaries, as well as Poly. Um, along with the principals, we're noticing strong teaching and student learning, and especially focusing in this year on the alignment of instruction in the classroom with the state standards, which are super very rigorous. <laughs> so. Um, that's one of our, our features that we're looking for is how closely aligned is the instruction at the moment with the rigor of the state standards. Our um, pupil services and communications team presented this week um, at an RCOE uh, function about our efforts last year to improve attendance. And we had improvement in every student group um, ranging from a portion of a percent all the way up to uh, more than 16% decrease in chronic absenteeism. So we continue that work and this school year to date, our um, attendance rate is trending three or 4% higher than it was last year, um, which had been an area of concern for us. So we're still um, tending to that to make sure that our students are here and ready to learn. And that concludes my report tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. So at this time, members of the public may provide comments on any items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. The board is limited to responses they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet are permitted to ask clarifying questions as to our presenter's public comments. Also, there were no public comments submitted for this meeting via the electronic communication submission form for the board meeting. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, can you please provide us the public input? Yes, we have two. We'll start with uh, Susie Freeman. Hello. 
Welcome, Susie. You have three minutes. Um, I'm here in regards to my grandson who, um, he goes to Ben Franklin and he escaped two weeks ago. And so far they don't have, like he has an IEP meeting on Monday, but so far he's missed two weeks of school and I don't understand why. I don't know if you guys are familiar with what happened. I emailed Ms. Renee Hill and I CC'd all of you guys, so I don't know if you saw it or if it went to your spam. But anyways, I don't know what to do to get this boy some help. And um, like I said, he has an IEP meeting on um, Monday. And, but until then, like he was supposed to go back to school today, he's been on independent study. And they, they haven't done anything different. Like he needs to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Do you guys know, are you, do you know what I'm talking about? Like we found out through the Ring app, like the school never contacted any of the emergency contacts. They didn't know where he was for 45 minutes. He's autistic, he has autism, and he's nonverbal. The police picked him up, they still didn't know where to take him. So anyways, um, he needs some help, he needs to get a one-on-one. -on -one. Who do I have to talk to, to to make that happen? Until, because even after the IEP meeting, how long before then, after that, are they gonna be able to get a one-on-one? -on -one? Like, you guys have to have an aide or somebody that can sit with the boy. I mean, or let me go do it, you know? Yeah. I, I'm willing. Yes, welcome, Ms. Freeman. I did, I did get your email. It was delayed, as you know, um, but I did get it. And my understanding is you had an opportunity to talk with Mr. Marshall. Yes, I did. Office. And, you know, yes. they all have so a lot of nice words to say. Yeah. They're very nice. Yeah. But we need some actions. Yeah. You know? So I'm going to ask uh, our director for special education, uh, Ms. Haley Calhoun, who's in the back there, okay. just to follow up with you. Okay. to talk about the, the process and it's, it's okay it's okay to be emotional about it it's your baby I get it it is yeah. grandbaby but <laughs> yeah, um, all my kids went to Ben Franklin without incident so uh -huh. you know yeah yeah Let, well let's try to keep it that way yeah, from yeah, here yeah, on for out. sure for sure <laughs> yes ma'am so uh, miss mrs. Calhoun will follow up with you if that's okay okay thank all you right. so much you're Have a good welcome night. thank you miss Freeman our uh, next speaker is Clarissa Cervantes Welcome, Mr. Vantes. You have three minutes. Thank you so much. And I want to be respectful to the uh, the board and just want to mention that I would have stayed. I have a community meeting I have to get to, so I'm going to be very brief in my remarks to, to try to follow, of course, the rules. Um, I wanted to generally speak in support of the Eastside community and the Casablanca community. I understand you have some items you'll be voting on today. Um, and I just want to respectfully ask and urge the board to please move forward with whatever actions to assure that the Eastside Elementary School and Casablanca School are built. We have to assure that these schools are built. Um, these are the only two communities that we continue to bus our students out of and I'm going to speak uh, specifically as a representative for War 2 that represents the Eastside community. Um, we have genuine concerns. There's genuine concerns of that school not having enough funding to get across the finish line. Um, we know every single day the cost of building and the rising cost um, to assure we can get projects across the finish line is going up. So every day that we wait that cost rises and I know that this board has a limited budget of funds that you're able to work with and a source of contention that continues to come up in the community is the STEM school and the funding that is going to this location that could keep these other projects from moving forward to completion um, and so I just respectfully ask you please assure that we could give our children the fair opportunity to grow up in the neighborhoods and their homes and their communities that they love and to go to a school in their neighborhood that is accessible to these communities accessible to these parents um, allow them to, to have that privilege and opportunity of walking down the street to their school of choice um, and that is what our community is asking for we had several east side neighborhood <coughs> community meetings regarding the east side elementary school and one thing that came up consistently was the importance of keeping lincoln high we need to assure that we preserve lincoln it is such a source of love and integrity um, and importance and lincoln literally has saved lives for our students i've heard it personally from teachers there from students from parents um, we actually had a celebration at city Hall on the Greer Pavilion where I got to meet um, a, a, a young mother who was a student there and she was celebrated and recognized for her, her work of moving through Lincoln High and changing her life into a, just a beautiful direction. And so I know that that has been a concern of folks is if we move forward with the plan, how do we assure we can preserve Lincoln? And I know that we have to partner together with, as a city of Riverside and I just want you to know as a War II representative, I'm committed to working with each of you to assure um, that we can find a solution. And 
and I just really want to respectfully thank you for all the work that you're doing. I understand these are challenging decisions and times we have to make, um, but please help us to make sure that ESA Elementary School can be built, that Casablanca Elementary School can be built, and that we could assure that there's equity and that the students are given the opportunity that they, that they need to have the best education. And thank you to Riverside Unified School District for being an exemplary school district where we could provide that education. I thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Councilmember Cervantes. That, <coughs> that concludes our public input portion of the agenda. We'll turn to board member comments, uh, starting with our student board member, Odera Adin. Welcome. Uh, hello. Um, uh, tonight, um, I would like to talk about uh, a few programs that uh, Martin Luther King is implementing at his school, and that uh, hopefully uh, this program uh, being successful can be implemented all across high schools. And so the program that I'm talking about is uh, Five Star. Now, Five Star is a uh, ability to track students when they're out of bathrooms, uh, when they're in between classes, because I know that it's an issue in many high schools that uh, bathrooms are being vandalized, there's a lot of vaping, and so uh, our ASB director and our um, admin did some research and looked at other schools who had the same problems and fixed those problems. And uh, solution, uh, for example, Great Oak, they implemented the program that we're about to uh, implement called Five Star, which uh, is a computer system where students, they sign out using their mobile device, uh, they scan, and it goes into the system, the attendance office, to say that this student is out uh, on the bathroom and it allows a limited amount of students out to go use the restroom. Um, and so we're running a test pilot of that now this week. Uh, we started around uh, today with a small group of students. And so, um, What we're noticing is that there's a limited amount of students out during bathrooms, and uh, we're able to prevent students who are known for causing issues in bathrooms uh, to be uh, let out during class time, reducing the issue. And so hopefully, uh, if this program is successful um, with this small group, we can implement it uh, at a large scale with the whole school and then once Martin Luther King goes through this process, through this process we can uh, bring it to other schools in the RUSD, other high schools, in the hopes that we can reduce the uh, safety issues um, and make sure that we have clean bathrooms for all the students to go to Riverside uh, campus. And in addition to the di discipline side of it, uh, Five Star can be used to reward students who are doing the right things, who are trying to be involved in their school uh, community. <laughs> For example, uh, we can track who's going to football games, who's participating in extracurricular activities, who's uh, attending uh, choir concerts, who is being an active member in their school community. And so using that uh, tracking system, we can determine um, and reward students with gear, um, announcements, uh, awards, prizes, just to encourage positivity, to encourage uh, being an active member in the school. And um, that's what I want to use my comment for. Thank you. Thank you for that very thoughtful suggestion and our staff will definitely uh, look at that and follow up with you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, board comments will be from Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Uh, I'll pass. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, Trustee Lee, Trustee Kinnear. Thanks, Dr. Farouk. Thanks for uh, sharing the things that you're doing at, at King. I think we all look forward to hearing updates about uh, how, it's, how it's working. Uh, restroom safety is a concern for, uh, for all of us, and, uh, and all of us are concerned about student participation in activities. So uh, seeing more data as, as it relates to what's happening with MLK kids uh, will be an advantage to all of us. So we look forward to, uh, to that. Ms. Hill talked about uh, her participation in in uh, visiting classrooms. Uh, I'll say something about football games. I made it to uh, Arlington, Polly, King, and Ramona. 
Uh, I haven't been to my alma mater yet, but I'll make sure that I get to, uh, to North at, at homecoming time. Uh, the football games, I mean, they were incredible. When our teams play each other uh, within our city limits, so King Polly and uh, Ramona Arlington, it, it's, they're, they're fun events. Uh, I mean, it, it reminded me of, uh, of, uh, of college football on, uh, on big game days on Saturday. Uh, the stadiums were packed, uh, lots of enthusiasm on the, uh, on the parts uh, of, uh, of students. The bands were active. Uh, so great football games. Uh, that's, that's my comments. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, we'll now proceed to the consent calendar. All items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the board vote unless members of the board request to have specific items removed from the consent calendar. Uh, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, do we have any public input on consent calendar? We have one. From uh, Shirley Tribble. Welcome, Ms. Tribble. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, what? Is on the consent. The, oh. There's some on the consent calendar. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to um, thank the board and everyone here. I was so happy to hear that student from North High School say how enthused they were to see the construction and everything going on at North that made me feel really good. And to know that even the students are noticing the construction work that's going on and that they're proud of it too. So I just want to let the board know and everybody know that you see how that can even help the students just by what little bit is being done. So I want to just, you know, to keep an eye and make sure that everything is continued for North. Uh, even though with the construction still, prices going up and everything, that we continue and to fight to keep everything going on for North. And like I said, it was just, I mean, I wasn't even thinking it when the student came up and said that, you know, that the students themselves were just really happy to see what's going on at North High School. And I went by there and I saw some things that were going on. So it's important that we keep on helping our schools to get improved and helping our communities to grow because we need our students to be in safe and be in their own communities. And we need the community so that the parents can go to the schools in their own communities. That's what's so important because if they're going to schools here and there, the parents can't go. The parents can't participate. So I just wanted to just say that I'm proud, and like the students said, that all the students were really happy to see what's going on at North High School. So continue the good work, and let's get it done. Thank you, Ms. Tribble. So s s staff requested we pull item J40. I'll turn it to Assistant Superintendent Ibarra to speak on that matter. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Frug. Um, we asked you that you would pull J40 so that we could provide clarification as to a clerical error on this item. It is referred to in the title being RCTA, but these tentative agreements are with CSCA, as you can see within the attachments. And we would like to make that amendment prior to you taking action to the title. All documents attached are completely correct, and there was just that one clerical error with regards to the summary line. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Ms. Ibarra. And so, uh, as a courtesy, uh, I'll turn to Odera, our student board member. Would you like to make a motion uh, with uh, omitting J40 through J42? Um, otherwise, we can entertain someone from another board member. Yeah, I would like to make a motion to approve consent calendar items J1 to J39, omitting uh, items J1, J41 to J42. And J40, you said also, right? J40. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, perfect. The motion has been made by student board member Odera. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second, Trustee Kinnear, please vote.
Okay, the motion carries unanimously. We can now entertain a motion on items J40 through 42 with the requested uh, amendment uh, re regarding the CSEA ch change. Motion by Trustee Lee. Second, Second by Trustee Kinnear. Please vote. Okay, the motion carries unanimously with the abstention from the student board member. We'll now proceed to our public hearing uh, portion of our agenda. The board will now hold a public hearing at 6.24 p.m. regarding the environmental impact report uh, for the Eastside Neighborhood Elementary School project. And I will turn it over to Superintendent Power to, uh, to present this item. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Uh, good evening, board members and Superintendent Hill. As the board is aware, the district is currently evaluating the development of a new elementary school campus in the Eastside community. The school would serve grades K through six plus transitional kindergarten, allowing approximately 800 students currently served by five surrounding schools to be locally served in their community. The district has evaluated three primary options for this project in a proposed environmental impact report. Here tonight, we have Mr. Dwayne Mears from PlaceWorks to provide a more detailed overview of the environmental impact report, followed by Ms. Belen Bobadilla, Interim Director of Facilities Planning, with an update on the next steps. Mr. Mears, thank you. Good evening. Again, my name is Dwayne Mears. I'm a principal with PlaceWorks, and I represent a consulting firm that does environmental work. Uh, plus a lot of other consultants, uh, traffic consultants, engineers, et cetera. Uh, this has been a long process, um, but we are here tonight at a major milestone with the, the final environmental impact report before you tonight. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the purpose of CEQA. Obviously, what we're doing is looking at the, at the environmental, the possible environmental impacts of a project. That's the requirement of CEQA. It requires all agencies to take a look at uh, the possible impacts and, and look for ways to minimize those impacts. We talk about mitigation measures, we talk about alternatives, or maybe an alternative way of doing something that would reduce impact. So those are the kinds of things that we, we look at. But it's also a public process. So we incur by doing this process, we encourage public uh, participation and other agencies participating in the process. It's an objective process as well. Um, and it's something that's re required to get a school site approved through the Department of Education. So it's a, it's a very involved process. It's a legal process. Uh, a lot of work has gone into this, and I'm really proud to present that to you tonight. Excuse me just a second. Okay. Okay. You see in the slide that uh, we have to look at all kinds of topics on, in an environmental impact report. It's really kind of the A to Z of, of issues from aesthetics to wildlife. Uh, the big ones typically are, are traffic impacts, noise, air quality impacts. In this particular case, historic resources was one of the big issues, and I'll talk some more about that. And let me talk now about the alternatives that we looked at, or these options. Okay, so option one, goes from, I know it's difficult to see these, but uh, it goes from Howard on the west to Victoria on the east. It incl includes that entire area. It's about 8.62 acres. Uh, it would build in an independent elementary school, as been mentioned, and it would find an alternative site for <coughs> the existing Lincoln High School. Option two. As you see, Lincoln on the east would remain in place, but we would still build an independent elementary school. Now, because we have less property, because uh, Lincoln is gonna stay in place, we need additional property. And so you see to the north here, we have a joint use proposal for Lincoln Park uh, for recreational uses and PE uh, resources, et cetera. So that's option two. Option three. We would build an independent elementary school and also build a new high school, a new Lincoln High School, so new facilities there. 
So let me talk about the, the findings. So we've gone through this very long process looking at the environmental impact report, or the environmental impacts. And you see a long list here in terms of those issues that we found to be less than significant. And so when we talk about uh, uh, impacts, we really are very focused on whether the impact is significant or less than significant. What we do is we set thresholds. If we're above a threshold and we have a, you know, it's a really an impact, we call that significant. And that's when we look for mitigation measures or alternatives. In, this, in, in the instances here, uh, from aesthetics down to wildfire, uh, these are impacts that we've found to be less than significant. Many of these are obvious, like wildfire, for example. And that's not an issue in this particular location, so that's less than significant. But we've looked through all of those in detail and found those to be less than significant. So let's now talk about those issues that we found to be possibly significant but in these cases, there's five of them here that we identified that, yes, they're possibly significant, but we also found mitigation measures that would successfully reduce those impacts to a less than significant level. And I'll just go through these very briefly. In terms of air quality, I'm talking about the construction process. You know, you can have significant impacts from construction, but we have mitigation measures that we've identified for those impacts to make those less than significant. In cultural resources, I'm uh, speaking specifically about archaeological resources and paleo resources, we have mitigation measures that are in the EIR that would reduce those impacts to a less than significant level. Hazards and hazardous materials, uh, we have certain standards that we have to, to abide by to approve a, a school site in California. Uh, those mitigation measures are in place and so that impact would be less than significant. And uh, the fourth one, noise. I'm talking about construction noise and possible impacts on neighbors, for example. And again, we have mitigation measures that uh, even though it would possibly be significant, we can control construction noise and make that impact less than significant. And then with tribal cultural resources, again, we can have monitors in place. We have mitigation measures to reduce those impacts to a less than significant level. Now we get down to those impacts that we call significant and unavoidable. So even though uh, we've identified whatever mitigation measures might be out there and what alternatives we've considered, we, we could not find uh, measures that would reduce those uh, substantially. And so we have to call those significant and unavoidable. Let me start with historic re uh, buildings. We have three historic buildings. One is the Wiley Williams House at 4343 Park Avenue and it would be demolished. It would be demolished on all three alternatives. And that's a, so that's a significant impact. We're losing the resource. Even though we will do other things, we will record, we'll take photographs, we'll record the historic resource there as best we can, but it's still, we're losing the resource, therefore it would be a significant and unavoidable <laughs> impact. We also have two buildings associated with the Irving Elementary School, the assembly building and the kindergarten building on the east. In option two, no impact would occur to those two structures. They would remain in place. In options one and three, there's uh, uh, some alterations that would be required. And so even those alterations, and even though we do those to, uh, in a way that maintains historic resource, we still call that significant and unavoidable. We have mitigation measures for those impacts. We document historic resources of all buildings that are out there, all three of them and we'll, there will be in, uh, renovation plans for the, the two buildings that I mentioned on the east. One more impact that is significant, and that's noise, and this is operational noise. Um, you know, schools have a lot of traffic in the morning and the afternoon, and that generates uh, noise from all of the traffic, and we do have residences that are, are right across the street on the 13th and, and in that area, so we are calling that, because of the amount of noise increase, we're calling that uh, significant and unavoidable. We looked at various ways, uh, such as noise walls and those kinds of things, but it's just not practical or feasible for us to do that, uh, for those to, to minimize the impact in those areas. Now, even with the, the significant impacts that I've identified, and even though they're unavoidable, you may still proceed with approving the project, but you do so in a way that you override those impacts, which you, 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 you would adopt a statement of overriding considerations that basically say you've got the benefits of the, the educational value of the school outweigh the environmental impacts that we've identified. So you can proceed even with those significant and unavoidable impacts. And that is the end of my presentation. I'll turn it over to...
<laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mears. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Farouk, Board, Superintendent Hill. So this slide here identifies the next steps. In front of you today, uh, we will request for the board to take an opportunity to approve the environmental impact report, which is a routine process of the CEQA, which stands for the California Environmental Quality Act. Your adoption today will allow the district to commence and determine any effects related to the acquisitions. It will also allow the district to explore designs. It will allow the district to see the effects of Lincoln Park and also allow the district to explore uh, conversations with the city as it relates to Lincoln Park. Once there's a schematic design, we will return back to the board and present those renderings to you for further approval. It will then take us uh, into the construction uh, plans and documentation in efforts to submit those to DSA for approval. And then leading us into submittal for state funding. This will then take us to uh, bid the project and then have these plans for ready for construction. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you so much for the, that overview. Uh, we'll now turn to Dr. Hernandez Alexander uh, for public input. We have one. Shirley Tribble. Welcome, you have three minutes. Mine is short. I just um, wanted to make sure, the one thing I did not see in, included in your report is about the closure of Park Avenue Street. That would be one of the considerations, like in option two, is that correct? Is she able to directly address the staff on this, or we can ask the request? We, can, yeah. we, we will ask on oh. your behalf after your oh, comments. Oh, okay, because that was something that did come up under one of the options, was that they would have to close off uh, Park Avenue Street, and then um, I guess the cars would have to go to Howard to get back on uh, 14th Street. So that, that was a should be an environmental uh, consideration too. And um, uh, also, um, uh, how about the, all of the property that has not been bought yet? My understanding there is still some property that need to be obtained. Will that be considered in this process because the way that 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 look it looked like they're talking about doing shovel without saying what's going to happen with all these other issues because when when they get ready to shovel i want them to shovel you, you understand i don't want anything coming up in between like now we can't do this because this wasn't taken care of before you know so if the city need to be involved, I would like everything to be clear out because we want that school. And so we want it to be done right. If we want everything addressed. So if option, you know, if we're looking at option two, we want the closure of the street. We need to know if the city's gonna approve that, if there's gonna be any issues with the community. Uh, we need to know about the properties because I want to be to that point where we're shoveling the dirt. You know, I think that's important for us to get to that point for that school. We have over, just found out, 1,500 kids that are being bused in the east side area between Casablanca and the east side area to school. They have to get up every morning at the crack of dawn to catch a bus to go to somebody's school. And that is not right. So we need to get these schools built. So it's very, very important. And I don't want any delays in between here. These questions need to be approached now. We need to know how this is going to affect. If closing off Park Avenue, we don't want that to come up to be an issue later on. We want all that addressed now, because I want, I want to be the first one to shovel that dirt. Thank you, Ms. Tribble. 
So uh, Superintendent Hill indicated that staff will follow up to address those comments. Uh, so at this time, after hearing the presentation by staff, comments from the members of the community, I'm going to close the public hearing at 6.39 p.m. and appreciate uh, all of your participation on that. Uh, we'll now turn to the action portion of our agenda. The first action item is connected to the public hearing. This item contains a recommendation that the board adopt resolution number 2023-2024-37 to approve the environmental impact report for the Eastside Neighborhood Elementary School. And I'll turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Ms. Power. Yes, thank you, Dr. Farouk. I just request that the board uh, approve resolution number 2023-24-37. Thank you, Ms. Power. I'll take public input. Our public comment is from uh, Yolanda Esquivel. Thank you, Ms. Esquivel. Welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Hill, board members, and staff. My name is Yolanda Esquivel, and I am here, and I am a member of the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC of Riverside. And on behalf of the families and children who live in the East Side, we are here to continue to advocate for the building of our East Side Elementary School for the completion of the much needed renovations of North High School and for the building of the Casablanca Elementary School. We are aware of the incredible increase of building fees. However, we urge you to please do what is necessary to finally bring educational equity to our communities of color. And we would like to emphasize that even though we saw the different options you have up there, and we know at the present time that perhaps option two is the best one, but in the past, and I think uh, there's record of it, that our community uh, voted for option three, and that is the one that we prefer. prefer. I just want to uh, remind everyone, and I don't think I probably do, but I will, as over 1,500 of our children have suffered the hardships of being bused out of their communities for generations. Our children have paid the highest price for desegregation. It is a time to correct, it is time to correct this horrible injustice. Board members, our families want you to know that we support every single effort you make to correct this great injustice. We have faith in each one of you to do what is necessary. We have faith in you. In reference to uh, the lawsuit against the building of these schools, we know that the people behind it are, the same, are, are of the same mindset of the people who took away our schools 50 years ago. They are responsible for having our children bust out of their communities in order to continue keeping them underserved and marginalized. To the lawsuit people, we want them to know that we are Americans, that we are faithful to the United States Constitution, and that we do pay our taxes. And some of us pay even more than some of you. Therefore, we also have a right to determine what kind of education our children should receive. And I do want to thank all of you for the great work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Esquivel. Our next speaker is Mary Figueroa. Welcome, Ms. Figueroa. You have three minutes. Hola, thank you. Mary Figueroa, and um, I am here because 58 years ago, I was one of the first children that was put on the buses in order to be part of the desegregation effort in the East Side, 58 years ago. As of today, we are still busing our children out of 
the Eastside community. So my question is, 58 years, when is that going to be enough? When are the children in the East Side going to be able to participate in after school activities, which we were not because we had to catch the bus? When are our parents going to be able to participate in parent teacher conferences without worrying about how they're going to get 10 miles across town? Right now, they're not. How long is it going to take for 1,500 of our children to be bussed out and almost 500 of them to be at one particular elementary school in the Canyon Crest area? And if you pull those 500, you're going to be left with the decision to try to figure out how to explain to those parents that their school needs to close because they don't have enough children up in that area in order to continue. And that's something you don't want to do because that means redistricting. And some of those children, unfortunately, the majority of them are not black and brown. But I am here to tell you, we know the three options. And while we are not in favor of taking Lincoln Park because it is the only green space that is currently in that area for the community, it will end up having to be something that we have to again suffer through giving up in order for our children to stay back into the east side where they don't have to get up at the crack of dawn. I used to get up in the morning, it was dark. I used to get home at night, it was dark and you're still making our children go through that. So each and every single one of you, I know personally at some point or another, except for our student trustee, but I'm asking you right now, as a community advocate for all these years, 58 years is enough. Make the decision so that we can move forward and give our children the equal education that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Figueroa. Our last speaker is Rita Nieto. Is Rita here? Okay. Welcome, Rita. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Rita Nieto. I'm an Eastside resident. I attended Lincoln College, as we called it back then, for a few years. Then, unfortunately, I, like Mary Figueroa, was bust out and bust out until I ended up going to North High School. All the rest of the year, I was not even in my community. And we lost something because my neighbors that were across the street went to a different school. And you're still doing that to our students. And I just found out Emerson, which is where my grandkids go, they're having a bingo night tomorrow. They have over 300 people that are gonna participate. So having a school and parents be able to be, take their kids there is important because these parents can go. My parents couldn't go out there. I was lucky that I could drive and I went to some of my kids' functions, but the parents are being denied this and it needs to stop. And as far as your environmental study, I know that they're saying two is probably the best option. My kids go daily, my grandkids go daily to the park, Lincoln Park. It's filled with children. And because those kids don't all go to Emerson, the kids are able to know their neighbors because they do go to that park and you're taking it away from us and i know they say they want to share it but at the end of the day they're going to use it as a playground so it's not going to be shared it's going to be used on a daily basis so we're going to end up losing it and like mary says it's terrible we do prefer option three i guess because then we keep the school there and we keep the park but what guarantees us that we're going to have a continuation there on the east side and believe me i'm like clarissa our councilwoman also know how much it's helped students. And not all students go there because they're misbehaved. A lot of them go there because for some reason or other they were behind in their studies. But that's their option, they go there, they're able to catch up and then go back to their high schools and graduate. So you taking that continuation away from these students and these youth who a lot of times are lost and they don't know what to do. 
a lot of times because they're home environments, but for whatever reason, the continuation is needed. And I know they've been trying to get rid of it for many years. I've gone to meetings where we had to fight for it. So now we're fighting for both. We need the continuation, but we need the elementary school and we need the park. So I don't know what you need to do, but we need all of them. And we need you to do whatever needs to be done so that we get that elementary school, but we continue to have that continuation and a park. So I know you got a lot on your plates, but I hope that you listen to what the community wants because we do need all of these. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita. I'll now turn to my colleagues uh, for comments and questions. Who wants to start? Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Thank you. Um, I, I, I just want to say that uh, I am very much looking forward to moving forward with the East Side School. I understand um, historically what's happened. Um, interestingly, desegregation um, was supposed to be something good for black and brown kids, and it ended up hurting black and brown kids. If it was gonna hurt anyone, it, it ended up hurting black and brown kids and uh, busing is vestiges of that. Of that, um, it is, It's been happening for too long for our, for our families. I myself was a bused kid. Um, I know what it is to get on a bus very, very, very early, sometimes without breakfast. Um, and if you miss the bus, you miss school that day. I also know what it's like to I can't, I can't visually remember my mom at my school. I don't have a, an image of that. And so it is not lost on me that, that it is high time um, that we do this and we do this quickly. Our commitment remains uh, to get the East Side School built. Um, and I know we have other comments, so I won't make a motion just yet. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. <laughs> Trustee Kinnear. I, I, have, I have one question. I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure uh, that uh, if I need clarification that it's given to me. Does uh, approving uh, this EIR with the option two configuration limit us by not allowing future consideration of the other two options? No, it does not. Okay, thanks. That's what I thought. You know, the, the, the board and uh, this board and, uh, and the community haven't had an opportunity for public discussion about the advantages and disadvantages of the three options. So I hope that in the future we can have that, the, that public dialogue. Uh, I have one concern, uh, and that concern uh, is, uh, is evident in the next two agenda items. You know, uh, budgets are, are just... Uh, Prices are escalating, and, and the cost of the East Side School is going to uh, be significantly higher than the $35 million that we started off with just a year and a half ago, and now the $62.5 or $63 million that we have budgeted now. I hope that this board regularly sees uh, an updated budget with uh, with the cost of the East Side School and how we're going to pay for those uh, those increased costs, uh, so that we can see its progress as we move forward in the in the in the future, and that we don't wait uh, until uh, two years from now and say, "Oh my gosh, the school's going to cost a whole lot more," and, and do we have the money or do we not have the money? I hope we have dialogue uh, as as we move forward. That's that's my only concern and I expect that we will so I'm excited about the East Side School and I second the the motion for approval for uh, the EIR we, we still have further de deliberation but thank you for oh, your, I'm sorry. Your, your comments uh, Superintendent Hill did you is there something you want to add? okay student board student board member Odera um, yes uh, I'd like to uh, say that I recognize the concerns that we have over the building of Casablanca and the east side and ensuring that uh, the disadvantaged community that had to bus all the way to school uh, missing being a part of their community to ensure that uh, reparations and that um, to ensure that this community um, is built back and that uh, this community is served. But I want to address, there is a question that a previous speaker had about Park, uh, Park Avenue Street being closed uh, as one of the options. Can you elaborate on that? 
Yes, Park Avenue is considered in this EIR report to be closed. I, I would like to add to that though, <clears throat> Odera, and uh, partly in answer to Mrs. Tribble's question also and Mr. Kinnear, the, having the environmental impact report concluded allows us to study all of those things. So one, it allows us to actually design so that we can be certain whether anything needs to be closed or moved or shared or anything like that. It also allows us to continue the purchase of properties that have not yet been purchased. Um, and it allows us to begin um, talks with the city in earnest. The city has you know, a concept and we've talked about it, but uh, it is bad practice to get ahead of the environmental impact report because that is the action that gives us a project that's approved to move full steam ahead on. So with the approval of the environmental impact report, we can do the city talks, the actual design, and the uh, remaining purchasing of property. Thank you for providing that context. Thank you, D student board member Odera. Is there anything further you want to add? That's it. Okay, thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Uh, thanks to all the members of the community that are here this evening that are speaking on this item. Um, most of you are not strangers to this item and you've been you know, fierce advocates to make sure that this project continues moving forward. So know that this board is right alongside with you, right? Since 2017, um, neighborhood schools have been a priority and unfortunately it's just a, a, a slow process. Um, but as the superintendent shared, uh, this, uh, assuming this passes this evening, this gives us a lot more tools in the toolbox to be able to push this project forward, uh, namely acquiring, pro acquiring property. Um, in addition to the uh, uh, items that Superintendent Hill mentioned, uh, I think it's important to share too that once we have a project, then we can discuss that project specifics with the community at large and what that looks like, what the details look like um, on those various configurations. Um, so. It is, it is slow, painfully slow, um, but uh, it, it is the process. So um, I'm excited tonight to hopefully push this uh, forward because it looks like, uh, at least according to this uh, timeline, uh, even if you look at the latter months for each one, you're looking at less than a year and a half to submit to uh, DSA approval, right? So um, I know a year and a half is a long time, um, but uh, at least, at least we're making progress, right? Because I agree with uh, Trustee Figueroa, 58 years is way too long. Uh, and I wish we had a time machine that we could go back and uh, give the previous board some advice about buying property in the east side and building when it's cheap. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have that, that privilege. So we just, we just gotta make do with what our situation is right now. So um, I'm glad we're in a position to do it. We're aware that costs are um, continuing to escalate. So the faster we push this forward, the faster we can lock in a price. Uh, and I'm confident that uh, between the people in this room, this board and this staff, that when we are putting shovels in the ground, we'll have the budget to get this project through and open that school. Thank you, Trustee Lee. I wanna echo the sentiments shared uh, with my esteemed colleagues here uh, and really just uh, iterate a, a gratitude and uh, appreciation for all of you in the community. Uh, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, it's uh, all of you, uh, whether have directly been impacted uh, by the, this precedent uh, you know, over 50 years ago or have been advocating and championing these efforts and uh, it's a culmination of your efforts. And so uh, we express that appreciation to you We've continued to move forward on this process. Public deliberations on building schools is uh, not a, uh, a timely exercise, but nonetheless, we're engaged in it. And it's a priority and it's continued to move along in the process. And we're looking forward to uh, this very important legal threshold, as our superintendent mentioned, to be able to formally define it as a project, to give it that recognition so that we can uh, engage on those uh, important next steps. So Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, you wanted to bring a motion? I do, I just wanna have one more clarifying question, I'm sorry. Um, just, just to um, answer Mrs. Tribble's questions or at least be able to, uh, to settle some of the uh, unsettled feelings of whether or not this is moving forward, I just wanna reiterate, this is step one. 
for us to start even considering the concepts, right? We, we drew up some concepts, we're not locked into them, is that correct? That's correct. So then we're, we're, we're this is step one, approving the CEQA. I am, I am curious as to, has there been any conversation with the city about any problems that could come from uh, closing off the street or taking a portion of the park? Is it too soon for that or do we have any information yet? It's too soon for that. Okay. I, I can say, um, Dr. NHA, that um, a while back, <laughs> uh, there were talks with the city because <clears throat> they were also um, accepting a grant uh, for some bike paths and that. So during the conversations about the implementation of the grant, we talked about the need to close Park, Park Avenue. Okay. So they know, again, I don't want to get ahead of the approval of the environmental impact, but as a consequence of talking about the bike paths, they knew that it was a part of one of the options mm -hmm. that Park Avenue would have to be closed and a possibility that we'd be asking to share Lincoln Park. Okay. And at that time, we had a conversation about if they're doing some type of bike path to not include that park as an option? The bike path was rerouted okay. as a result okay. of our conversation. Good. Uh, the other question is, if, I don't know if you could speak to this, uh, is uh, what kind of assurances or what kind of processes do we have in place to acquire the remaining land? We, uh, we do have the process of starting to look into those and um, starting those conversations with the land. But we, we've, we've already acquired some and we just need to acquire the rest. Is that yes. where we are? Yeah. So, and the last thing is, I think, um, um, Dale, you, you brought up a great point and I think, uh, I think I even got these words from you. Um, how do you build trust? You build trust by making small goals and meeting them, right? Um, I think what we see here, part of the, part of the, the, the passion and part of the um, sense of distrust that we feel from our community is because we've broken trust. And as an entity, as a district, uh, with the East Side and with Casa Blanca. So um, I would like to see this conversation continued where we make small goals we have updates that we constantly keep this alive on the agendas so that we can uh, feel confident that even if it is a year out that this is these are the steps we're taking and if, even if they're small steps we're saying to the community we're con we continue committed in this effort and and we will see this school all the way through so i i, I just ask that you you take that into consideration to do that and also, Mr. President, to keep it alive in the agenda. Absolutely. Finally, I would like to move to adopt resolution 2023-2437 and approve the environmental impact report so the district can move forward with the building project of the East Side Neighborhood Elementary School so we can stop busing our kids. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Second, Trustee Lee, please vote. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. We'll, we'll now proceed to the next item, which is uh, related to a few of the bids that came in for Casablanca Elementary School. I'll turn it over to Superintendent Ms. Power. Thank you again, Dr. Farouk. As you know, we went out to bid on the Casablanca Elementary School project in 23 categories on August 17th, 2023. 20 of the bid packages were just awarded as part of the consent calendar. Tonight we have Ms. Belen Bobadilla, our Interim Director of Facilities Planning to go over the Casablanca project and discuss the overall bid findings as well as options for the three bid categories that remain. Recall that on October 7th, 2021, the board discussed the budget needs for various district projects, including Casablanca Elementary, and it was noted then that the budgets did not include escalation or contingencies as we could not predict at the time the scale of any future increases. With that, I welcome Ms. Bobadilla to the podium. Thank you again and good evening.
Here we see an overview as a reminder of Casablanca. We have approximately 9.8 acres, student capacity of 750. This site will be a TK through six, 90,000 square feet of building space. Our architect is Go Architects. CM is Tilden Coil. This is a DSA approved uh, project and the bid date was August 17, 2023 with a project budget approval on October 7, 2021 of 53 million. The bid results on 817 are as follows. 23 categories were advertised resulting in a total construction cost of 59,709,348. When including soft costs and contingency amounts, the total project equates to 83,593 with 87. Here we have a few bid findings. Five categories identified as earthwork, asphalt, fire sprinkler, roofing, concrete, and general services provided a bid and then decided to withdraw their bid. This is allowable per public contract code 5103. Next findings in six categories identified as structural steel, casework, doors and frames, food services, chain link fence, and site utilities. The bids received were less than three bids. And lastly, in three categories identified as concrete, site utilities, and electrical and low voltage, these were more than 20% of the engineer's estimate. All of these findings are scenarios that come with bidding a large project. The following slide will show you a few comparisons of recent construction projects and their costs. Here we have comparison number one. This is a new construction project at Menifee Unified School District, elementary school number 15. It is a K through five school. Casablanca is a K through six. Menifee has a 800 student capacity and Casablanca is a 750 student capacity. Menifee's new construction consists of 72,000 square feet Casablanca consists of a larger square footage at 90,000. Construction cost for Menifee is 54,507,927. Casablanca's construction cost is 59,709,348. This includes all 23 bid categories. Menifee is currently under construction they have completed all of their underground uh, work and is installing the steel and is preparing to open their school site next year in August. Comparison number two is at San Marcos Unified. This is also an elementary school. This project is a K through five. Casablanca is a K through six. San Marcos is an 850 student capacity. Casablanca is a 750 student capacity. San Marcos new construction is 91,444, sorry, 447 square feet. Casablanca is 90,000 square feet. Construction costs for San Marcos resulted in 58,457,918. Casablanca's construction cost is 59,709,348. San Marcos construction is substantially complete. They're looking to do a ribbon cutting before the end of the year. Surrounding districts are seeing the escalation and the project comparisons shown provide a glimpse of the dynamics other districts are facing as it relates to the projects and bid amounts. In the comparisons to both districts, neither have a community workforce agreement, yet the cost of construction is similar. This project was bid under a new community workforce agreement. This section of the agreement provides a couple of benchmarks that allow staff to conduct analysis when considering next steps for the project. The benchmarks are for less than three bids, 
for a particular prime or bids more than 20% of the engineer's estimate. This slide out outlines the allowable options for the board's consideration today, along with the pros and cons. I will read the options. Option one, rebid categories less than three bids with CWA. Option two, rebid categories less than three bids without CWA. Option three, rebid categories over 20% with CWA. Option four, rebid categories over 20% without CWA. Option five, accept all bids. After analyzing all of the options, staff leans towards option four due to possibility that bids could come in lower. However, with option four, there is no guarantee of any lower bids. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you uh, for your presentation. We have uh, two items on, uh, for public input. We'll start with Shirley Tribble. Welcome, Ms. Tribble, you have three minutes. Okay. The budget increase needed for Casablanca, um, and we know that the increase, that it's gonna be an increase either way it goes, it's gonna cost more. And so we are looking for what we can get. One of the things that we need to look at is to completely eliminate the STEM high school. Anything to do with the STEM high school, we need that money. I mean, this has just come down to it. We need that money, every penny that we would spend on that STEM school because we cannot justify buying the property for that school with the 50-year lease and then give the property to UCR. UCR has more money than we will ever have. So we cannot afford it. We just can't afford it because we need that money to go towards Casablanca. We need it. So it must be eliminated. That is just one thing that we cannot continue to even discuss anymore. We want it just to be forgotten, just buried. I'll bury it myself. And because it's a shame, here we are going backwards again to get schools built in our neighborhood. I started elementary school in Casablanca. I started in kindergarten until I moved to the east side and then started Emerson School, which at the time was predominantly white. So I had to have a tutor for two years in order to be caught up. That was one of the reasons why they closed Casablanca, because it was behind. There was no such thing as bilingual teachers. When I was in the first grade, they told us to help the Spanish-speaking kids by they would teach us what to say, and then they told us to tell the Spanish kids how to say it. We were taught to teach them. I knew more Spanish as well as I know English at that time. So we can't, we cannot, uh, we need the money, and so we want that STEM, to, uh, just forgot, forget about that, because uh, our kids cannot be bust. And um, like I said, it's just, it's a shame. And we know that by Busing, the biggest fear is that the elementary schools in the outer city areas will not have the populations to continue some of their schools, and it's a, it's, it's a fear. And they are afraid their kids might have to be bused, guess where? To the city. And they're afraid of that. So we don't want them to be afraid that they might have to come here, but we do want these elementary schools. And Casablanca has waited over 50 years to be built, and it needs to be built now. Thank you. Our last public speaker on this item is Jim Rush. Welcome, Mr. Rush. You have three minutes. Good afternoon, trustees. Ms. Hill. Uh, my name is Jim Rush, business manager of IBW Local Union 440. Um, today, I understand the cost of construction, right? Construction rises, it goes up. We're feeling the same pain. My counterparts down in San Diego, we're going to build a new school prior to COVID. Construction cost 2.5 million. Now we're at 6 million, right? 
Um, and seeing these bids that came in, and I'm speaking specifically to the electrical and the low voltage, uh, I asked our electrical contractors to do a little research and reach out to the firm that provided the electrical, um, electrical engineering estimates as it relates to this project. And there seems to be some disparities between the plan documents that were for those to be bid off of and the actual engineer's estimates. So I just want to kind of touch on a couple of those items to be sure that you guys are making an informed decision tonight uh, with this process. So as it relates to the school and the estimate, the total square footage is listed at 63,025 square feet. Uh, per plan sheet G1.1 site plan code analysis, the total square footage listed in that drawing is 71,518 square feet. That leaves a delta of four, uh, excuse me, of 8,493 square feet. So if you take that delta and multiply it by the engineer's estimates of roughly, I think it was like $97.90, that's potentially $832. $832,000 that are missing out of those engineers' estimates. Another item that was not listed in the estimate but was on the drawings was the off-site traffic signal shown uh, in, the, in the drawings, in the plan drawings. Just the raw cost of that traffic signal setup without any contractor markups is $896,000. Those two items alone account for $1.73 million that may be missing Either the drawings are wrong or the engineer's estimates are wrong, but that's a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. Also, as it relates to the low voltage package that was submitted, um, and talking to our electrical contractors, it, this, the, spe the specs for this project are not the same standard specs that you guys have typically used on our USD projects in the past. This one was spec'd out at a much more expensive AV system for this school. Just as an example, uh, University Heights Middle School, the rough cost per classroom was $6,900 for the audio video. The way the specs read in the drawings, for this project, it'll be $42,000 per classroom. So I don't know if that, the new spec for the audio video was taken into consideration when the engineers put, up their, put together their estimates, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention, right? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Rush. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, that concludes our public input, and we'll turn to my colleagues for comments and questions. Trustee Lee. Uh, yeah, my question relates to schedule. Um, how does a decision tonight affect the schedule of uh, Casablanca opening? It does not. What do you mean? How does it affect the schedule? The, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so uh, if, we, if, we, if we vote for staff's recommendation, it doesn't affect the schedule, right? No. Is that what you're saying? Correct. If we don't vote for staff recommendation, how does that affect the schedule? Let me, let me approach. If, we, if, if you proceed tonight, <clears throat> it won't break the schedule. So it'll affect the schedule because you have three bid areas that uh, would have to be rebid and you know move at a different pace than they would have otherwise. But it, I have been told it won't um, blow the end date. Not a very eloquent statement, but it won't um, push the end date farther out. So there might be some things within project that move. If um, so, that would apply to either accepting them all or rebidding them now wait until later till decide unknown i didn't ask that question specifically but uh, you have we definitely have more of a chance of not be meeting the end date because our next board meeting is october 5th and you have to make a decision then all right so i mean the last thing i want to do is is delay the project right for lots of reasons um but my other consideration uh, which makes me lean towards the staff recommendation is that you know we spent a lot of time discussing negotiating formulating multiple meetings uh, uh, an agreement um, and the agreement has these provisions in it um, to help 
protect against, you know, cost overruns or maybe lack of interest in a bid or who knows what, what the what the what the situation is. Um, so I mean if you, you have those for a reason and if we're trying to make sure, especially with costs being so expensive, um, to make sure we have dollars at the end of the day, uh, I mean I, I don't I don't see why um, why you wouldn't exercise those. Right? Like, I want to hear from my colleagues on some of those topics, but, um, you know, unless it were to delay the project, which I, I don't want to do. So that's kind of my first thoughts. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, student Board Member Odera. Uh, yes, I have a question. It ties into um, the union speaker who was talking about the difference in prices uh, due to property or just different estimates between the engineer and the district. Uh, how does this happen? How do these difference in uh, pricing, why do they occur? Sure, I will t turn it over to uh, Tilden Coyle to help with that. Good evening. Good evening, this is, I'm Jason Howarth with Tilden Coyle Constructors, basically responsible for giving uh, general estimate information and planning projects. And so uh, the gentleman that was up here uh, explaining some kind of, you know, hindsight is 2020. Uh, the bidders will uh, go through everything themselves and be responsible for it. And so they always provide good feedback in regards to how an estimate's done for an entire project because we're trying to get close to an entire project cost for all trades, whereas they're the experts and they will provide additional feedback and they're responsible for that bid to bind to construct it while we're trying to get close to inform you as a client what to expect. And so we were relatively close when we gave an updated information of 57 million and change before the bids were coming in. Uh, and you saw obviously variations when the, each of the trades. So there is a, there's always a learning process in this with the contractors that share additional information and we learn from that and we refine the process. It's not a perfect science. Uh, it's some principles done to get a pretty close value for a project and then there'll be variations in it when the market is tested or you get actual bidders to bid. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, and in addition, I have um, one more question. Yeah. So when we, um, when we accept the bids to be like that final cost, if we were to accept all of the bids, um, when the total estimate is 83 million, is this uh, not to exceed this number or is it, um, is this the total? That is correct, that's the maximum amount. So um, in, pra in a practical sense, if we were to complete the project, there isn't, it's not guaranteed that we would reach 83 million, it's just that the project, the cost of it wouldn't exceed 83 million. Correct, so we take the construction cost and then we add soft cost and contingencies to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, the great questions and thank you for a very fair and candid response. Uh, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Thank you, that was a really good question and I think my question is a follow-up question to uh, the gentleman from Tilden Coyle, I'm sorry I didn't get your name, Jason? Uh, can you explain a little bit more or, you know, we heard from Mr. Rush about uh, engineers' estimates being one thing and being maybe uh, sh smaller in square footage or smaller in scope. Um, how do we account for that? I mean, is there, is there any, um, I don't even have the words to ask the questions, but how do we, how do we bridge the gap? What is, can you talk that through what, through that a little bit? Yeah, uh, yes, so uh, we're looking at a project from a, a big picture. We're trying to get a total project cost for all trades and construction. So we know, let's say enough to be dangerous to get pretty close with each particular trade that, that sums up the trades to get you a generally accurate expectation for when a project comes in. Much like the presentation here and said, let's compare some other schools. How, how much is it generally for this school to this school to this school? Uh, the square footage is specifically that we're getting at and some of the discrepancies has to do with how you interpret the estimating science. 
So someone might say, hey, this is a 90,000 square foot school. Well, the interpretation might be, hey, let's include spaces like covered walkways and janitor's closets. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes when we look at schools, we're looking at maybe the enclosed conditioned space. Mm -hmm. And so there's different kind of technical terms between gross square footage, net square footage, uh, exterior covered space. And so depending on how you kind of look at that cost per square foot, when, when you uh, compile your estimate, each okay. trade may look at that a little differently. We try as a uh, uh, professional firm giving advice and projects to apply like a standard approach across trades and it gets us pretty pretty close in there and okay. then we always get feedback in the, in the learning loop. So I, I hope that answers your question as you kind of look at the nuances between how do you really interpret the different square, okay. square footages? So there's the full scope. And then I think the way that uh, Ms. Bobadilla was breaking it up is in categories, right? When you say trades, you also mean categories based on yes. cement, electrical. Yes, ma'am. You know, so that's the category. So categories within and those are... categories, mm -hmm. sometimes we underestimate, sometimes we overestimate. Yes. And in this case, we underestimated for electrical. Is that correct? Yes. The, yeah, I, I don't disagree with any okay. of his kind okay. of perspective, especially when they get into the science of AV. AV is ever-changing, and so uh, that is a kind of a, a trade that is increasing in value and cost and complexity in an IT infrastructure in each classroom. So it's great okay. feedback, actually. Great. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for clearing that up. Yep. Um, I just I, I just wanted to engage my, um, my colleagues in a conversation about kind of where to go next, and I'll, 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 I'll put it out there and then we can just go back and forth. But as the way that I see it is that, you know, we have three commitments. You know, we have, we have the commitment to break ground quickly, to keep our commitment to moving forward with this project without delay. Uh, the second commitment is to honor our agreements, that the, we uh, move forward on a community workforce agreement and that's what we agree, had agreed to. Um, and three is that we be good stewards of public funds. So I feel like we need to figure out how to be able to, at least in my estimation, uh, to get um, as much as all of those of those three as possible without uh, delaying this project not one day. I'm having a really hard time wrapping around uh, my mind around the fact that if we if we race the the board and start all over again with bids, that there won't be a delay. There's not a project that I've ever been a part of that that's the case where we start all over again and there isn't a delay. So I think I need a little bit more conversation about how we, how, what kind of assurances we have that there won't be a delay um, and then kind of go from there. So S Superintendent Hill just did speak to the fact that it, she's what uh, my understanding is, is, is they're saying that if the, we were to bid out the overall time frame that is planned for the Casablanca, that would still technically be on schedule, but it would be it would be a hit to the uh, that schedule in terms of you know its efficacy of of reaching that time frame. Uh, so the overall time frame would be there, but it would it would be a, a, a little bit of a challenge to it by doing that extra bidding process. Is that fair? Yes, and a little bit added information to that is because the with the twenty bid categories trades <laughs> that you approved, work can get started on the project. And these three gotcha. uh, can come, uh, so those three might be delayed within the schedule, but I've been told it won't break the end date. Okay, thank you. Because we can get underway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Kinnear. I, I have uh, some concerns and I have some, some questions. Uh, my first, first with a concern, uh, I hope that, that, or I expect uh, our new assistant superintendent uh, will do a better job of keeping this board aware of costs, especially escalating prices. Uh, in the presentation, you know, we used Menifee Elementary School number 15 as an example. Uh, a year ago, Right, just a year ago, we were using $50, $50 million as our preliminary estimate when a neighboring district was using $80 million. And I, I didn't know that. No one told me that. I just heard from, from you, Jason, that, that you felt like you were spot on with your overall estimate of, of, the, of the project. Uh, frankly, I knew costs were escalating. 
I knew, I knew that. But, you know, the wind was taken away from my sail when I heard 85 million from 50 some million. Uh, I, I, never, I never heard your estimates. I never, I never knew that we, were, that we were that far apart. It doesn't change where we are today. I mean, I, you know, where we are today is where we are today. Uh, but I expect in the, in the, in the future, our, our new assistant superintendent is gonna do a better job of communicating with this board uh, what, the, what the financial aspects of, of our big projects uh, are. I heard today that, that uh, I think I heard from, from you that, that uh, uh, Menifee uh, has not implemented a, a, a CWA. Uh, I heard that, that, that they, they didn't do that. And it appears that their cost and our cost are relatively similar. Uh, in terms of, 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 of the expectations. And they're not far off of, of, of what Tilden Coyle was, was, uh, uh, was, uh, was, was estimating. So I guess I, uh, my question is, you know, it, are, how might we compare the actual cost of the CWA in the two projects? Because right now I, I, don't, I, don't see much, I don't see much difference. I mean, uh, and I don't know if that's scientific or not, but uh, you know uh, that that's uh, that's that's what I'm looking at. My my second concern relates to soft costs, and soft costs. Uh, I think uh, Jason, you you know because we've had discussions about this are are difficult for me to get a handle on, and th and they're they're a concern for me. Uh, the total the total soft cost. It's my understanding is based on a percent of the construction bids. Uh, well, you know, I, what percent is that? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I could look up in, in my, my notes. But less than two years ago, we were using soft costs that were based on $30 million. And then just a year ago, we were using soft costs based on, on uh, a total project cost of fifty million dollars, and and you know now all of a sudden you know soft costs uh, soft costs have have uh, have escalated just like everything else has uh, has has escalated. You know when I look at, at at soft costs, you know one of the one of the fees in soft costs are are you know uh, the the work of of an architect, and and I'm picking on an architect here, uh, but. That's that's uh, that, that's okay. Has the work of the architect uh, increased dramatically in less than two years? That their cost went up that much uh, over uh, o over the course. So I guess I, I'm uh, I'm frustrated with with soft costs. I still don't understand them. Uh, I, I you know I guess I'm told that you know the. The, our costs could have gone down, and the architect and others, you know, could have lost money uh, in this process. But in this day and age, I guess I don't see costs ever going down, and uh, and you know, and and they just increase dramatically for uh, for so for the, some of those things. And I don't know if I'm the only one who's concerned about soft costs, uh, but we're spending a lot of money uh, on those, and we don't seem to. To, to have a handle on it, or at least I don't seem to have a handle on it. Uh, an, another thing that, that, uh, that I guess a, a, a question that I have is our community workforce agreement uh, allows us to rebuild a project when there are less than three bids, uh, or if the bid is 20% or, or, or above the engineer's estimate. Uh, we, we all agreed to that. CWA, uh, that that CWA was was important to uh, uh, to, to me. Uh, you know, we may have been reluctant about certain aspects of the of the CWA, uh, but we said these were the terms of the CWA. Uh, why would anyone be upset with us? And maybe there's nobody upset with us. But why would anyone be upset with us uh, if we follow those terms? And we rebid, uh, we rebid any of the items, uh, because those we agreed that that was going to be part, uh, part, part, part of our process. 
So on one hand, I think we ought to rebid. Uh, I think we ought to take a look at, at those, uh, those three items that were uh, way out of proportion, uh, whether it's because there is confusion over uh, what's included or not included in estimating the, the bid or, or whether it's something else. Um, you know, maybe, you know, the agreement allows us to rebid. Maybe we should just do that. On the other hand, on the other hand, you know, our, our project is costing the same as a neighboring school district project, project, and it matches what our construction manager said was the estimated cost. So maybe we ought to just accept things the way they are. So I'm, I'm really torn with, with, what, to do, with what to do here. Uh, on, uh, on, on one hand, uh, our, our, our workforce agreement allows us to do it. Let's do it. Let's go out and rebid the three, the three areas. Uh, it's not going to, uh, to delay the project. Why wouldn't we do that? On the other hand, you know, our construction manager said that we we're spot on with the total cost of the project and it compares with what Menifee looks like. Uh, maybe we just accept the bids, move on down the road. Let's get Casablanca done. We all want it done. Uh, that's the most efficient, fastest way to, to, to proceed. So right now I'm torn uh, because, of, because of those, those, uh, th those two, two thoughts. Um, so that, that's it for now. Thank you. Maybe my colleagues can help me be untorn. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, so, you know, I want to put um, some perspective, you know, the way I, I'm uh, viewing this. One is I think that the comps that were provided, they are comparable, but there are some distinct, distinctions. Like, for example, the Menifee one, I mean, it's within Riverside County. It does not have a CWA. It's 18,000 square feet smaller and the other thing we have to keep in mind is they're not at the same stage as we are. They're actually further along. So and you can only, if we had to, if we had to uh, take a risk or assume something or bet on something, we'd assume that escalation is going to increase over time. And so I don't know how much, is it like a year further ahead than where we are, we're at right now, Menifee? That's a significant amount of time, and it's still comparable. Again, even being 18,000 square feet, and, and again, not having a CWA. So one, I think that's material, and, and to Tilden Cole's point, again, they're looking at it from the broad, the total project scope. They're, they themselves are not focusing on the individual trade. The other point I'll make is that it's unprecedented during the time that I've been on the board that for any project I've ever seen that we've decided to individually pick out specific bids and decide within the overall scope, this is comparable, but is this individual bid an outlier and we're gonna pull that out and, and rebid it or do anything of that fashion. Um, just because an agreement gives you the option, to, to be clear, it was an option. It doesn't mean the option needs to be exercised. That gives us uh, uh, flexibility, but it doesn't mean that it needs to be exercised. I think, uh, it would be a very bad precedent that of all of the projects that we've been doing, that the one project where we decide to micromanage and take this kind of situation where we're going to individually pull out a bid when, even by Tilden Coyle's uh, own point, if they're looking at it from the totality, it's very possible in any situation, if we were to go retroactively and look at projects, are there specific uh, trades where there was uh, a, a more expert understanding from a, a trade compared to the, the the project construction costs, so forth, that we could reevaluate all kinds of things. I've never felt it's the purpose of the board to micromanage and get into that level of minutia of a, of a bidding process. Uh, I, and given the fact that, to me, the, the comparable aspect, because again, what are, we do, what are we doing? We're doing, the, the staff recommendation is to rebid, which will impact the time. Whether it stays on overall schedule or not, you know, that's, we would find out, but it would impact the time. Uh, it's a, it is a disruptive aspect. We would do that specifically in an unprecedented way just for this project, number one. And, you know, and again, we would, the other aspect of it is we would be removing the CWA to accomplish what? The, the comparable bid in a Riverside County building an elementary school for an 18,000 square foot smaller school that's a year further out than us is still relatively the same price. 
what point would we be trying to make from that? I strongly think that we need to do what we've always done, and that's uh, respect the process, that's, uh, that the, the bidding process independent of the board intervening on, on that. I think we're respectful to giving the Casablanca and the community every moment of having the best probability of getting this project going as quickly as possible, not putting anything that adds another layer to it. Uh, and so I strongly uh, would recommend um, and propose that we um, motion to accept all the bids and move this project forward as quickly as possible. <laughs> Trustee Lee. Uh, thanks, Dr. Fruit. You bring, you bring up a lot of good points. Um, I just want to, we don't get a chance to debate very often, so uh, just going to push back on a couple things. I think you're right, it's unprecedented, um, but it's unprecedented because this is the first project we've ever been under a CWA ever, right? And traditionally, this, um, these provisions would not be exercised by the board, like pulling these things out, because staff would do it. Staff would, would pull it out and rebid it without even coming to us, right? Because that would be their job. But because we have the CWA in place, they don't have that ability. They have to come to us to get authorization to do it, and that's what they're doing. They're coming to us to ask for that permission that they normally wouldn't have. So I, I, I agree with a lot of your points, but I think it's a little bit uh, presumptuous to just assume because we have, this, this would be setting a bad precedent. We've already set a new precedent, so we're gonna have a different experience uh, on these projects moving forward. So I just think that's, that's something to consider. Um, on uh, uh, Trustee Kinnear's point regarding soft costs, I get it. I mean, soft costs are a big part of, of the budget. Uh, and this is coming from a guy who makes his living on, on soft costs. Uh, so, so, I, so I get it, but I think it's, it, it, it might be a discussion for um, you know, moving forward, um, but I think we're already kind of uh, in agreement with what our percentages are with those, those things. So I think it's a, a good conversation for later. Um, the other thing, and I, and I just wanna make sure I, I have my numbers right, and then I do have a question for, for Jason, is you know, we, we talk about how, how um, more expensive this project is than we originally budgeted. And I agree with Mr. Kinnear. Um, you know, the world was a much different place in 2021 when we thought it was 53 million. And even at that time, it's my understanding that there was no escalation and no contingencies in that number. Um, so I, I do think that was a, 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 you know, in hindsight, not, not the best uh, approach. And then moving forward, uh, I think we need to reset all the projects moving forward to make sure that, that we're in alignment with what the market is. Uh, because the market's the market, but we just need to make sure that our community, our staff, and our board are all working off the same number, off the same page, so that we can prepare, and it's not an emergency like it is right now, to make a decision so we don't delay the project further. So my question is, um, based upon some of the points that my colleagues brought up, if we do rebid these projects, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what is the likelihood that now that our, our, these bids are all public, right? So now every, everybody who's gonna bid, if we were to rebid, knows the number. They know what we're willing to pay above our estimates. We're 60 days past when the original uh, uh, project uh, bid requests were put out. So assuming there's some escal escalation since then. How much risk versus reward are we, are we uh, putting ourselves in by delaying it? Do we think there'll be significant cost savings um, by, by putting these three back out to bid, given the new set of rules and circumstances that Dr. Farouk have made that are in our CWA, um, with like my quick, you know, back, back of the napkin math, you know, it's like three, four, five, almost $8 million over the engineer's estimate just with those three. What is the probability that we would see savings by rebidding these packages? Do I understand the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, since we're kind of going into a, a deeper dive into uh, the bids and the bid findings, I think there's something unique that happened on the electrical package with uh, kind of pre-qualified bidders uh, needing to have pre-qualified uh, 
subcontractors to the prime contractor in order to have a responsive bid. I think that adds a little nuance. So if we're getting pretty detailed here or into the weeds of the discussion, uh, I think you have a, uh, a good chance if you looked at uh, rebidding the electrical because of that nuance there that's a little different than the rest of the packages. Uh, otherwise, I think the staff did a great job giving you the pros and the cons to uh, making an informed decision. Uh, that's the only thing that I can think of or see that's there. So, you know, there is no real science to it. It is a bit of a gamble like it was presented to, to say, hey, if you go back to the market, uh, sometimes uh, bidders, more bidders are interested, sometimes they're not. Uh, bidders are out there procuring work and then they themselves have challenges sometimes even getting bonding capacity because they're hitting their bonding capacity lids and it, they kind of limit out. They're, they're full from work for a period of time. They've captured their work. And so we're doing our job to try to draw that interest in. So I think there's everything that was spoken about here and some other factors uh, there. And there is a, a while it doesn't currently on paper affect the end date of the project schedule, it does create some challenges to kind of start a race or a, or a horse in the race a bit later uh, than with everyone else, right? So there's a lot of competing interests and I don't know if there's a good way and I can't really put a number, there's not a science to this part of the equation to give you a more specific answer that might be helping you and what you're looking for. I, I kind of cherry picked a, a new, unique situation about electrical, uh, and think you know the the rest of the bids, you know should should move forward uh, based on my expertise in working with many districts and seeing different types of situations with bid results themselves. So when you, when you say the rest of the bids, do you mean the twenty or do you mean the twenty one or all of them with the exception of electrical or all of them with the exception of the three that are on the agenda for this we item? We already approved the other ones. There was no, a consent yeah, yeah, three, there's No, there's concrete. There's three under There's discussion right now, utilities. concrete, utilities, and electric. Right, I meant the other the ones in the consent calendar. Right. So I'm that, talking about those. Well, that's what I'm trying to This is new information. To clarify, yeah. This is new information, if yeah. I'm understanding correctly. I'm, I'm saying to, I think you said it well with uh, approving all of the bids. Uh, it's under the context of this, what's the probability of getting a better price? Okay. When I look at it and size it up, I think there is a better probability if you're rebidding electrical to capture some savings. That's, that's my perspective and experience. I think you should then approve the rest of the bids because I think it, it's the, that's the only one that has a little bit of a nuance uh, to it from, from what I see in, in, in the situation. Just because there was some uh, misunderstanding or Yeah, there's a pre-qualification. There's a pre-qualification set needed for the prime contractor and uh, specific subcontractors to it. And so the, the two low bidders for the electrical uh, there, you kind of have to move down the line in order for, to get a responsive bid. Uh, that one, because of that situation, is a little different than maybe some of the current discussion here. I'm saying based on that, there's probably a better probability if you rebid that one to to have a, a better number, right? If, if you were going to gamble on it in regards to go back to the market. Be the least risky. To that's to the play. least risky move on that one category. Okay. Everyone, all the other ones, in my opinion, are are within reason and good. There's not something that makes it uniquely different from a probability standpoint, mathematically or, or in my experience. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Sorry, Jason. I, I, <laughs> I was trying to catch you before you sat down. <laughs> that's, that's, that, no, no worries, I'm here to help. So you said that so I'm looking at these three categories, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether I want to take them wholesale and rebid mm -hmm. or break them apart. Um, you, we've mentioned, we've talked a lot about the electrical low voltage mm -hmm. uh, being kind of an anomaly. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't too thrown off by that because it was like 35% uh, higher than the engineer's bid, mm -hmm. but I was really thrown off by the site utilities which is 110% over. So in my mind, I was thinking if we were gonna do any rebidding, it would just be that one. Can you speak a little bit as to why this is not a concern to you? So when, when we look at uh, certain packages of numbers coming in and those kind of two bidders being close together, 
on site utilities, site uti there's certain trades that have more variation in them by nature of the work. Okay. So uh, electrical can be that way, especially when we talked about like AV systems. There's a lot of technology that sometimes moves that up. And there's other, there's other factors out there in each trade that make them unique. Site utilities have to do a little bit with underground related work and how they perceive their work in speed and productivity than we as estimators ourselves looking at an entire project. And, and uh, uh, the scope itself from in looking at it uh, was also increased during an addenda. So we're trying to project uh, a value based off a set of documents. And there's some clarifications that also come out and in, in increase scope during that particular process, which is required to complete the project. It's very typical. And so sometimes when we know that there's kind of a scope change in the middle of the bid, so let's say I gave an updated estimate in June, but we're, you know, bidding six weeks to two months later, and there's additional clarification, that site utilities one didn't surprise me for those two factors, changes in scope and how they look at all the underground work that's unique to their pro production rates for each project site. And so there's a lot of variables in that particular one itself. So are you saying that, um, that uh, the difference between two bidders could be more varied in scope or they're very similar because of the nature of the work? Like if we, if this bids at, you know, 4.5, the next best bid, bidder is not going to be far away from that because of this, they know how much this work costs and it's, you're not going to get variation C because of the work. C correct. So when we're looking at a, a, a package or a, a set of bids for a particular uh, category or trade, right, you get three. It's kind of like, you, it's like a grouping, if you will, if you're uh, getting close to a target. And if you have a couple bidders in, in one area and they're close to each other, we're basically saying, hey, those two different companies sized up this work and information very similarly. Okay. So independent of our estimate, uh, that is the real market condition. Okay. Uh, and so that's why we have a level, a higher level of confidence versus the actual data delta range itself. Okay. So then the likelihood of getting a significantly lower bid for site utilities. Do you think that's a high likelihood or a low likelihood? I think it's a low likelihood okay. in site utilities. Okay, thank you. That's very, very sure. good information. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, student board member Odera. So I have a question uh, regarding the comparison between like Menifee Menifee and San Marcos. Mm -hmm. So that construction cost of around like 55 million, I forgot what it was, but that's uh, not including soft costs. That that is correct. That's only construction. They also add soft cost and contingency to that. Okay. And then um, my following question is that uh, I saw that in the estimate that we um, created the estimate in 2021, like the follow out of the pandemic. So was the bidding uh, was the estimate different because of the uh, costs during the pandemic? Was the estimate made in, made in consideration of the um, pandemic and the um, economy and all that? Right. So back in 2021, square footage was approximately $450 compared to what we're seeing now. I think, I think Odera has a different question. Odera, uh, the engineer's estimate was done recently because in our, in our um, workforce agreement, it requires the engineer's estimate to be done within 120 days of bidding. So we asked our general contractor to give us an updated bid. The number that you're hearing from earlier was uh, a request from the staff for a budget amount for the project. So two different things, overall budget for the project versus the engineer's estimate of project cost at this current time. Okay. And then um, also um, from President Farouk, uh, he said that this was the first time that we are completing a project under a CWA uh, in the history of the um, RUSD, is that correct? Yes, I was making a different point, but that is correct, that is correct. So um, prior to the CWA, how often did we re uh, rebid on similar projects? I'm not sure it's possible to know Odera. Uh, Belen is interim director, and so this, our staff who was here before um, 
is not here to tell us that, and honestly, I wouldn't have been tracking that that closely. Uh, but like Mr. Lee commented, in our prior project, the staff would have gotten all those 23 bids in and then made all of this analysis, have done some decision making, and may have rebid a project or two or the whole project. Um, so it's just be part, in part, as Mr. Lee said, uh, due to the workforce agreement that we have. Um, those benchmarks, um, when Mrs. Bobadilla made her presentation, she said it gives us some benchmarks of where the analysis should be done. So a little bit of different process for the staff, look at those benchmarks, analyze those spots, and then bring that information to the full board to get some guidance. I can just, uh, just add on. Uh, and I don't have precise data, but um, I'd say since 2020, because I sat on a subcommittee too since the Measure O has passed, and it's not uncommon for projects, bids within a project, to come in not in alignment with what we thought they would, and they'd have to get rebid. I mean, w one that comes to mind is Longfellow. I mean, I think that project came in at, I think original estimates were like $10 million for that project, ended up being 20. Um, and I think also on um, King, we were looking to do the parking lot at King, and the cost estimates were, were significantly higher than what we expected, so the project is still on hold. So it, it happens. Okay. And, um, following, I know like there's a sense of urgency to complete um, the East Side Elementary because we're trying to um, service um, a disadvantaged community that's been long disadvantaged. But, um, this is more to Farouk, or um, would it be bad precedent for us not to rebid under the CWA? If, uh... So my take on this is, I think this is a very interesting situation because the, the, the engineering estimates that are being done by our professionals, you know, we're not professionals in this specific field. They're looking at this from the standpoint of the overall project scope. I, I want to re reiterate that. We are then evaluating within a lens of an individual trade when they themselves are acknowledging they don't do it in that fashion. And to Dr. Hernandez Alexander's point, again, from our vantage point as laymen in f f not being professionals in this, one of those bids jumps out, but then, but then based on your expertise, even something that on the surface seems like an egregious thing, actually that's just the nature of that industry standard and escalation and what, what's amounted to it. Um, my point is, is if the overall project scope was out of whack or however we want to put it, I think there would be a much more compelling argument to say we should, we should rebid uh, to the re references that Trustee Lee made. I'm not up saying that we shouldn't consider rebidding projects in the future, um, it, but I'm saying we should be looking at the bigger picture. We should be looking at the overall project aspect. Not only, again, to me, that comp uh, in Riverside County, a year further out, 18,000 square feet less, without a CWA uh, in that situation. But we're also, essentially what we're, we're, what we're saying here is that we are considering, in the term that's been thrown around and used is gambling, that's the term that's been used, that we're, uh, we're going to potentially put a risk for the time frame, because this it would create a risk, in the hopes that a project that was bidded out in August, that will be bidded out, rebid, whatever ends up happening, will in the future turn to some kind of meaningful value because time is also of the essence. The, the, the time lost of actually doing the work is, has a value as well, right? So the, the, the difference of the cost would have to make up for that, right? That is what we're gambling here, to potentially do one trade, at most three trades, to me, this is, it's, it's, this is overkill. Again, if the overall project budget was over 20%, completely different situation. We have, it's, a, it's, a, it's a material thing. I think it's it, it, in respect to the community, to Casablanca and, and, and everybody, we should make a, a good faith effort to give the best probability possible to make this project on schedule, move as efficiently as possible, uh, and not gamble over what? Because again, we'd have to recoup the value of the extra time lost in whatever the cost savings are. So the cost savings would have to be very significant. 
for a very specific individual bid. I, I just don't see the, the point of that. I, I really think we should accept all bids uh, and move this forward. Um, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, or sorry, Trustee Kinnear. Okay, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. I was going to uh, make a motion to accept all bids. Okay. Uh, do you want to say something before we... I, I appreciate the dialogue. I, I, have, I still have a lot to learn, and I'm, I'm learning every day, I guess. I appreciate the expertise of uh, district staff. I appreciate the expertise of, of you, Jason, at uh, Tilden Coyle, and, uh, and certainly from, uh, from the, the, the union's perspective. I want to make sure that I heard, that I heard you right, Jason. Uh, you're, you're recommending that we don't go out to bid with concrete. You're recommending that we don't go out to bid uh, for uh, for site utilities, and uh, and you are recommending that we go out to bid for uh, for the uh, electrical, the AV part, uh, low voltage part, whatever whatever it's called, uh, and you think that there could be uh, enough cost savings to make it worthwhile for us. Is that what I heard? I, I'm going to do a little bit of nuance because I was trying to listen to and answer a question that's you know it's kind of drilling down into into something which is a a probability of cost savings by making a move right, yeah. and so I think there's a probability of cost savings by rebidding electrical. Uh, I think the dis the staff has done an excellent job giving their yeah, recommendations. So I don't know if I would go as far as saying that's my my recommendation because it's balanced with, uh, Dr. Farouk says it well, a time, a time value, right? And so that time value of getting all the trades on board at the same time uh, and moving them forward and starting the submittal process and procurement, there, there is uh, kind of a, a bit of insurance in a way to have all your trades on board and getting the job moving forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's a bit of a, I'm going to say an intrinsic value, technically on paper, like we've said earlier, uh, is that by rebidding, it, it doesn't affect the schedule, but it does have time implications within the schedule overall there. So I, I think that's maybe a better way to offer up my advice. Yeah, uh, Mr. Rush uh, uh, spoke uh, about some of the challenges that uh, uh, they had in bidding the electrical part uh, of it uh, is is that is does that relate to why you think there might be some cost savings there uh, no I, I think it really comes uh, down to a, the unique situation of the, a, a prequal rule uh, basically to deem people responsive and so when you look at the bids that that uh, came in that was a unique situation with the prequal rule many districts uh, follow it just like RUSD. I've seen it happen many times before. And then the next thing, to, the right thing to do is to take the response of bid to those that followed the prequel rules and you move forward. And more times than not, our clients just follow the rules. They move to the next low bid like is presented here and they move the project forward. Okay. All right. Thanks. O okay. I will uh, take the motion on the floor. Dr. Hernandez Alexander motion to, to accept uh, all bids and move forward. And I will uh, second it. So uh, please vote. Yeah, mine's not generating. We can do it manually if necessary. Okay, thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. I think this is a great demonstration of the, the district giving every effort to make this Casablanca project happen as quickly as possible. I really appreciate everyone's professionalism. I know this is a, these are new processes and it's a, the deliberation we had was a value uh, so that we all have a better understanding of how to be uh, judicious with this process. Thank you. Our next action item tonight is related to the Casablanca Elementary School new construction project. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Ms. Power can uh, begin this presentation. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, so now that uh, we have bid Casablanca and uh, and we've accepted all bids, we know what the cost is going to be. Um, we've talked about it tonight. As you recall, in October of 2021, the board allocated $53 million to, to the Casablanca project. And uh, tonight we will need to request that the board um, increase the budget for Casablanca to $83.6 million, uh, which is the cost of the construction plus soft costs and contingency. And that is the request. Thank you. Do we have any public input on this item? No public input. Uh, uh. Oh, we do? We have three. Okay, I thought, when you said L3, I thought you said there were three, three cards. That's why I was confused. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we will start with Charlotte Stowers. I can't read it that clearly. My apologies. Okay. Welcome, Miss. Welcome, Ms. Stowers. Uh, and the next speakers will be Bob Garcia and Cindy Mendoza Collins. Welcome, Ms. Stowers. Hi, thank you. I want to say thank you for always being on board with us. We appreciate you sticking with us from the very beginning. Um, I'm a resident of Casablanca for 71 years. I went to Casablanca school, second grade. They um, bust us, uh, which was a very terrible experience. And I graduated from Casablanca School, and I would love to see more people go to Casablanca School and graduate from there. So I appreciate it if you vote for our project. We really need it. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Garcia, followed by Cindy Mendoza Collins, followed by Don Madden. Welcome, Mr. Garcia. You have three minutes. Thank you. Dr. Farouk, uh, board president, Superintendent Hill, and uh, esteemed board members. On behalf of the Casablanca Community Action Group as a vice president and community liaison, we thank you all for helping us and working with this project for many years that we started 17 years ago. And you've accepted everything that we've uh, asked you for. So we ask you tonight again uh, to accept the revised budget and move forward with bringing our project together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Our next three speakers are Cindy Mendoza Collins, followed by Don Madden, followed by Shirley Tribble. Welcome, Ms. Collins. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Farouk, board president, esteemed board members, Superintendent Hill, and cabinet members. Um, thank you again for your continued support of our Casablanca Elementary School, and we also ask for your ongoing support of the East Side School as well. Um, as you know, the history of our schools, um, we were separated, we went busing, and we couldn't have parent involvement. But anyways, I just wanna keep this short. Um, I know you have hard decisions to make, and I appreciate your dialogue and asking the right questions and making sure you get this right, because this is the only time you get it. It was kind of um, bothersome. I'm speaking on behalf of the Casablanca Community Action Group, the chairwoman. Um, and co-chair of the Casablanca Education Advisory Committee. It was kind of bothersome to us that we were told first the groundbreaking was gonna be in July, then August, September, and now we're told November, but either way, it's happening, um, and we appreciate you putting the timeline so that way nothing gets delayed, that's great. Um, but really what I wanna finish saying is really that you can't put a price on doing what is right. We've waited so long for this school, it's coming to fruition slowly but surely, and we appreciate all your support, the support of our staff here working long hours and everything as well. So thank you for continuing support. And we look forward to our groundbreaking and the, and the happening of our new school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Our next speakers are John Madden, followed by Shirley Tribble, followed by Paul Chavez. Welcome, Mr. Madden. You have three Good minutes. Evening. Good evening. Uh, 
Dr. Farouk, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, Superintendent Hill and board members, I'm Don Madden. Um, I am- Mr. Madden, if you could raise your, thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. I am simply here tonight to unite my voice with those that are here to um, advocate for uh, adopting the revised budget. Um, it's abundantly clear that enough has been said that uh, all of us are very pleased to uh, hear what's transpired tonight. I'm going to forsake my uh, um, supporting arguments and simply get to the bottom line and say, we thank you. We uh, offer our congratulations for the wonderful job that you do in providing um, uh, the school facilities for all children, for all neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Our next three speakers are Shirley Tribble, followed by Paul Chavez, followed by Margie Ted Williams. And Dennis Garcia is the final one. Welcome, Ms. Tribble. You have three minutes. I must have signed off some things. I, I have no idea. But anyway, I just want to say thank you all. You all, all do such a wonderful, wonderful job. And so I appreciate it. I appreciate you listening to me. But you've done it. I'm just so happy that everything worked out tonight. So thank you so much. And I'm just so happy and proud to get things going. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tribble. Our next speakers are Paul Chavez, followed by Margie Tad Williams and Dennis Garcia. Welcome, Mr. Chavez. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I've got to say, I barely made it out here. So uh, hopefully the school can go a lot faster than I am. You know, so I thank you for doing that on uh, this because we've been waiting, waiting, and waiting, and our students have been suffering, to be honest with you. And when the school gets built, I think that the Riverside Unified School District will implement the best education system in, the, in Riverside, period, because you have the opportunity. You have a new school, and you have individuals looking for programs to attend and they're being held back because they don't have that uh, those individuals items in that school or they're overpacked so we ha you have as board members the opportunity to get that school at the top level so we can have individuals coming in from all over riverside to that school thank you very much Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Our final two speakers are Margie Ta Ta Williams and Dennis Garcia. Welcome, Margie, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Board uh, President Dr. Farouk and uh, Superintendent Mrs. Hill and the rest of the board. Um, my name is Margie Tad Williams. I also was a resident from Casablanca, and um, I joined the rest of my group here is in saying thank you for all that you have done. It was a long journey, and we appreciate it. Uh, we know that the kids that are going to be coming to the school are going to be just excellent students. They're going to be able to go forth and do something with their lives because of what you are doing here today. So I just wanted to say thank you and also to please accept the revised budget and let's move on. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. Our final public comment on this is Dennis Garcia. Welcome, Dennis. You have three minutes. Yes. Well, Dr. Farouk, um, board, uh, if, I'd if really you could like please to, raise the, the mic. Oh, yes. I'd really like to thank you for uh, making this uh, a, a reality today. You know, it, um, it's been so long coming, and I was bust, and it was a good experience, but it had a devastating effect on the community, and to change it, it's the right thing to do, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Dennis, that conclu concludes our public input, and we'll start with student board member Odera. Oh, okay. Your, your thing was on here. My apologies. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. 
I uh, have a motion, so if, if my colleagues have comments, I'll defer to them. Okay, we'll start with Trustee Kinnear. I'd just like to make a comment on behalf of Mr. Hunt, who can't, who's not here tonight. Uh, I know that Mr. Hunt would love to make the motion uh, in, uh, to, to uh, approve the increase in, uh, in, the, in this budget. So with all due respect to, to you, if I could offer a motion on behalf of Mr. Hunt, uh, it would be my pleasure. Wow, he went up to you there. <laughs> Uh, that, that, thank you for that's a very nice sentiment um, trustee Lee did you want to say anything uh, just briefly I'm, I'm really glad Ms. Ms. Tribble's happy um, <laughs> want to make make sure that's clear and uh, um, and to uh, to Cindy uh, we do make a lot of hard decisions every day uh, staff makes makes uh, gives us the information so we can make hard decisions they make hard decisions every day but this was not a hard decision so thanks for all your support thanks for the whole support for everybody here today Thank you. Well said. And uh, just want to, again, express our gratitude to the Casablanca community and Riverside community because we all care about this project. Um, just it's all of you that you're uh, just an inspiration to us. And uh, we, we're trying to make you proud. So thank you. Uh, so Trustee Kinnear makes a motion in spirit of Trustee Hunt uh, to ap approve this uh, budget recommendation. Second by I'll second that. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Please vote. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Are we good to pile through the, the end or did you, does anybody need a break? You guys are good? Okay. Okay, let's do it. Uh, so th our next action item. <laughs> Aaron, maybe Aaron wanted a break. <laughs> Before us is a recommendation for, for the board to adopt resolution number 2023-2024-43 to certify the unaudited actual financials from 2022 to 2023 and establish the appropriations due to the reconciliation of estimated ending balances to the unaudited ending fund balance. Ms. Power. It, it'll come on. Okay, there we okay. go. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Uh, so to certify the unaudited actuals for 22-23 is to indicate that the report was prepared in accordance with Education Code 41010 and is hereby approved and filed by the Governing Board of the School District pursuant to Education Code 42100. So essentially that means that we use the California School Accounting Manual and that we will file the report with the County Office of Education. Uh, before I begin the report, I would like to thank the business services staff who put together the unaudited actuals. Um, especially here, we have here tonight our director, Nikki Hoff, and we have our assistant director, Ar Ariana Arciniega. So thank you both for being here and for your hard work on this report. So this is a look at our financial accountability and reporting timeline. We're looking back again at 22-23, even though we're already in the midst of 23-24, so it makes it a little bit confusing, uh, but the board will see 22-23 again once more in December with audited actuals. Right now, uh, we are at unaudited actuals, which is um, for approval tonight. It needs to be approved by September 15th, which is tomorrow, so we're right in the nick of time. In this presentation, I'll go over what we actually ended 22-23 with in terms of revenues and expenditures, and the comparison to what we estimated when we built the 23-24 budget that was approved in June. So here you see a comparison of estimated actuals to unaudited for unrestricted general fund. Um, we started with a beginning balance of $119.7 million. We had estimated back in April that we would end with 146.4 million, and we are actually ending 22-23 with 163.5 million. That's due to a decrease in revenues of almost 2 million and an increase, I'm sorry, a decrease of expenditures of 19 million. Here you see the major changes in the unrestric unrestricted general fund. So, um, 
The fair market value adjustment is an accounting of the value that's in the county treasury of the dollars uh, from year to year. And so I've talked to the board about that before. That's that adjustment. Um, we also had more interest than we had estimated um, in April and a bit more lottery as well, um, thanks to the uh, lottery players in the state of California for that. Um, our expenditures were $19 million less because we actually had the opportunity to use restricted dollars first for about $12 million in expenses. Um, and what that means is we had uh, grants that were expiring or due to expire soon, so we were able to utilize them and free up um, the unrestricted dollars. So that's why there was that swing from um, April to now. But you'll see that $12 million expenditure on the restricted side in a moment. We also had timing of expenditures of $3 million less, which we're still going to spend the dollars. We're just going to spend them now in this current year. We had $2 million less in textbooks, and then overall $2 million less in um, other services. On the restricted side, we had started 22-23 with $70.6 million. We estimated at that time in April that we would end with $131 million, and we're, we actually ended 22-23 with $154, almost and a half million. This is a result of an increase in revenues of $27 million and an increase in expenses of almost $4 million. So here you see the major changes in the restricted general fund. The majority is due to revenue that we received that we had not anticipated uh, for the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant, as well as the learning recovery block grant. If you recall, um, when we did the budget adoption and the estimates for 22-23, um, we were basing that on the May revision from the governor. And the governor had proposed large cuts to those two grants in order to fund, um, really it was in order to fund COLA this year, even though the allocation was from 22-23. Once the budget was enacted by the state, those cuts were very minimal. And so this is really just restoring what we thought we had back in 22-23, and then we didn't have, and now we have again. Um, we also had some changes in the timing of ESSER spending, and lottery is also, um, we have lottery and restricted as well as unrestricted. Uh, on the expenditure side, again, as I mentioned, we used those restricted dollars first, and then we had some timing of spending, we're still spending those, the $8 million. We didn't spend it by June 30th. We're going to spend it this current year. Here you see our fund balance summary. This includes both unrestricted and restricted general fund together. Uh, so our beginning balance in 22-23 was $190.3 million. We had projected to end 22-23 with $277.5 million and we actually ended with 317, almost $318 million. Um, most of the change was in the restricted and committed categories, as you can see there. And again, the change in the restricted was due to the increase or the restoration of the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant and the learning recovery block grant. And then we had some other minor changes to carry over. In the committed fund balance, uh, we had an increase of $17.8 million, and that's on the unrestricted side. And we, we added $17 million to our declining enrollment in ADA revenue loss mitigation um, category. And if you remember, when we adopted the budget, um, we had shared with the board that our revenue loss over the next four years is actually $85 million due to declining enrollment and ADA revenue loss. Um, and we had projected a $37 million set aside at the end of 22-23 and had projected $68.8 million for 23-24. So this updates that number to $54 million. Um, Bringing that extra 17 million updates it to 54 million, and then we'll have a revised number again at the first interim report. And then with shade structures, we actually were able to reduce that commitment 
by eight million because of the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant coming in higher than we had anticipated, we didn't have to set aside those unrestricted dollars any longer. And then we had, again, some other carryover that uh, will carry over into 23-24 to spend now. And then finally, we have our other funds. Um, we started with a beginning balance of almost 124 million and ended 22-23 with 213.6 million in our fund balance of those funds. Now, most of that you can see is due to the building fund. We sold $80 million worth of bonds in 22-23, and you can see that there in revenue sources, and that um, increased the fund balance by 80 million, and therefore, overall, we have more money in the fund balance there. And with that, I request your approval of the unaudited actuals for 22-23. Thank you, Ms. Power. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, Dr. hernandez Alexander. do we have public input? No, we do not. Okay. Um, we can entertain a motion unless anyone has questions. Trustee Kinnear? I have one question. The last slide shows uh, 26 million ending balance in capital projects. That's the 20 million that you referred to a number of months ago. Yes, uh, for state matching funds. For state matching funds. And then uh, we're expected to get another 20 million. Did I hear you say that correctly of state matching money? We state? are expected to get another 35 or to 40 million. 35 to 40, when, when are we expecting that? Relatively soon, yeah. It's already been approved that we'll receive those dollars. Okay, thanks, you answered my question. I make a motion to... Uh, we, before we do that, student board member has a oh, question. Go ahead. Oh, Darren. Um, so are these leftover funds just um, a 22 to 23 year, or is this like an expected trend that's gonna follow after uh, this school year? It it's not an expected trend. Okay. Uh, we do our best to budget to what we what our needs are each year, and then we true it up as we go. At the first interim report, um, you saw on that first slide, the first interim report it gets modified and and adjusted. At the second interim report, the same thing happens, and then with estimated actuals, we do it again, and then we have our our unaudited, which are presented here tonight. Okay, and then uh, one more question. Um, I know that when the state government hands over funds to the um, local uh, governments, that um, money that isn't used goes back to the state. Is this is that policy part of the funds here, or um, in restricted categories that can happen? Um, you saw I presented the restricted side uh, and the unrestricted. In restricted, there are deadlines um, and there are strict uses for funds in some cases. And so that's why we decided to use that 12 million of restricted dollars so that we wouldn't have to return it to that. In that case, it was the federal government. But the unrestricted funds, that stays within the district? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, student board member there. Uh, Trustee Kinnear, we will entertain your motion now. I make a motion to approve. And, do, and do, also thank the business office staff. Yeah, you. thank you. You guys did a great job. Uh, can we second by Trustee Lee, please vote. And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Thank Power. Thank you. And I know you're still up here as the next action item is a recommendation that the board adopt resolution number 2023-2024-42, establishing an appropriations limit pursuant to Article 13B of the California Constitution, adopting 2023-2024 appropriations limit GAN limit. Yes, thank you. So I, there is no presentation. Uh, the GAN limit is something that the board has to adopt. Um, the GAN limit adopted through Proposition 4 in 1979 sets appropriation limits for school districts. Before you is a resolution to establish our GAN limit for 23-24. For the limit is calculated by taking the prior year's limit and adjusting for average daily attendance and inflation. This year, our GAN limit is $328.1 million, and the appropriations in the budget do not exceed this limit. Therefore, we ask you ask that you adopt resolution 2022-23-41 to adopt the GAN limit. Thank you, uh, Ms. Power. Uh, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, do we have any public input on this item? No comments. Tr Trustee Kinnear? Move to approve. 
Second. Trustee Lee seconds. Tr motion by Trustee Kinnear, please vote. Motion carries uh, unanimously. And that brings us to our final item, uh, which is approval of employment agreement of the new su Assistant Superintendent, uh, Mr. Oren Williams. Yes, good evening, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. We, under item L6, it's our duty to be able to consider approval of the employment agreement between Riverside Unified School District and Assistant Superintendent Facilities Planning and Development, Oren Williams. It is part of the process that through government code section 54953, it requires the board of trustees prior to taking final action on an employment agreement to have oral report of summary of a recommendation for salaries, salary schedules, compensation, paid in the form of fringe benefits for local agencies, executives, and the assistant superintendent in a local agency executive. Therefore, it's my duty to be able to report this out tonight. The term of the employment agreement is for two years with an expiration date of June 30th, 2025. The assistant superintendent will be placed on step five of the assistant superintendent salary schedule, earning an annual base salary in the amount of 252,404 for the 23-24 school year. The board of trustees may make additional annual cost of living adjustments to employees base salary in its discretion. The district will provide the assistant superintendent with medical health equivalent to that given to the other district managers and his contribution to medical insurance health care premiums will be equal to the district managers. Upon retirement, the district will provide post-retirement health benefits if the assistant superintendent meets certain eligibility criteria and subject to the conditions set forth in the attachment B that was provided to you within the um, agreement. The assistant superintendent will acquire sick leave at the rate of 183 hundredths days per month. The district will provide the assistant superintendent with $150,000 in life insurance. And the district will pay annual dues for professional community or service organizations approved by the board. The district will reimburse the assistant superintendent for miscellaneous business expenses and for all actual and or necessary travel expenses within the limits in the accordance of the district policy. This concludes the legal oral summary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ibarra. And I, I just want to uh, give an acknowledgement to Belin Bovadia. Uh, she's stepped in in an interim role during a very eventful time with the CWA, Casablanca, and everything. So really, you know, kudos to you for your, your service and leadership. Thank you, Belin. Uh, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, do we have any public input on this item? No, we do not. We can entertain a motion. Trustee Lee? I'd like to make a motion to approve this motion, item. Motion to approve Second. by Trustee Lee. Seconded by Trustee Kinnear. Please vote. And this item passes unanimously. Uh, we have uh, come to our meeting conclusion. Are, are there any board members who would like to request agenda items for future meetings? Seeing none, I will uh, adjourn uh, at our meeting at 8.31 p.m. Thank you, everyone.